Alrighty, so Eric shoots. Okay, we are live, and I would like to welcome everybody to tonight's uh, July 7th, 2020 Board of Selectmen meeting. <clears throat> In accordance with the requirements of the open meeting law, please be advised that this meeting is being recorded and broadcast over the Lunenburg Public Access Channel. Town of Lunenburg, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, is currently following the guidance from the Lunenburg Board of Health, Massachusetts Department of Public Health, and the CDC regarding the virus and steps communities can take to prevent its spread. All town facilities are open, but by appointment only. In accordance with the governor's order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general law chapter 30A, section 20, all public hearings are being conducted remotely. This meeting will be broadcast live through local access cable on Facebook Live on the public access Facebook page and will be able to be found on the Lunenburg Access YouTube channel within 24 hours after the meeting. Uh, the following information is provided for members of the public that would like to participate in the meeting remotely. To participate from a computer or any smart device, iPad, tablet, phone, please use the link uh, found on the Selectman agenda. If you have the Zoom app already, this meeting is public meeting webinar ID number 909-174-0347. For those of you without access to a computer or any smart device, you can dial in by phone. The number is 888-475-4499. And once again, the webinar ID is 909-174-0347. People on smart devices will be able to participate and show they want to speak by raising their hand. Please locate that raise your hand function on your smart device. Those people who are dialed in, you can use the star nine once you are in the meeting, and that will show me that you are uh, raising your hand, and then I will call on people to speak accordingly. Uh, I will take a roll call attendance, and I'll just use them as I see them on the screen. Ms. Adams. Uh, here. Mr. Dwyer. Present. Mr. Marino. Here. Mr. Jeffries. Here. And a uh, chair is here. Madam Town Manager, are you present? Present. Okay. Okay, so let's get right to it. Uh, we will start with the call to order, which I just did, and the Pledge of Allegiance, which we will, I think my screen is frozen, right? To most yeah. people. So then Katie, you're gonna do the, the standby flag. It's all yours. There we go. <laughs> Um, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. We will start the evening with public comment. Any public comment from the board this evening? Um, That's a traditional I, raise your hand, but okay, yeah. go ahead, Ms. Adams. <laughs> Um, so I just wanted to, it may come up later in a report or something. Um, there were a lot of questions and still a lot of questions, um, about the town beach. And I did read, um, via Facebook that it's opening, um, July 13th. So maybe Heather will be able to fill in more information, but my real public comment is just more about communication. I know over the years we've set goals on communication and what people are saying is they don't know what's happening and they don't know where to look for what's happening. And what's interesting is some people keep putting a link on Facebook to a um, website, lunenburgmass.myrec.com, which when you open that link um, is information about Lunenburg Parks and Rec. However, I went to our town website to try to find that link or try to find how I could find that link. And there doesn't seem to be any connection between that website and our town's website. So I just wanted to check with Heather or anybody, if there is this secondary website about Lunenburg Parks and Rec, if it could be connected to or affiliated with our official um, um, site. When you go to um, the parks tab under Lunenburg Mass's, you know, our .gov page, it says Town Beach 2020 to be determined. 
And that's all it says, no information. And then there's this other, other website out there with all this data, but no way to connect the two. So if it weren't for Facebook, which I don't um, really like to think of as the most valid source of information, I wouldn't know where to find that link. So that's, that's sort of my comment is not just for the town beach, but in general to look at communication in terms of, do we have the best possible access to communication happening through our web page and maybe we get to revamp it a little bit. Agreed. I, th I think we really need to, first of all, any, we, we should make it clear to any board, you know, the IT director is managing the website basically. Is that correct, Madam Town Manager? Each uh, department has trained staff to update their own pages on the website. Um, in that particular instance, that's a new software that the new rec director has started using. Um, I believe it's, so it's just a software. It's not a, a web, a new web page for the town. So it would be just a matter of putting a link on our website to it. So I will follow up on that. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other public comment from the board this evening? I will say that I hope everybody had a, an enjoyable Independence Day long holiday. The weather was very nice, and uh, I hope people got out to enjoy it and recognize the holiday uh, the best they can, given the, given the virus situation. Any public comment from the public? We'll wait a moment to see if anybody is raising their hand, which they are not. Okay. Any announcements? Madam Town Manager, any announcements from you? I do have a, one announcement. The Lake Shirley Improvement Corporation sent me a announcement and that was needed to be posted on the website, which it has been put up under news and announcements about their aquatic treatment. So I'll read it. Uh, areas of Lake Shirley will be chemically treated to control invasive and nuisance aquatic aquatic vegetation on Thursday, July 16th. The US EPA slash mass registered aquatic herbis her <laughs> herbicides to be used are Tribune. Ne I'm not gonna pronounce any of these correctly. <laughs> so maybe Todd can help me out. Nautique and Red Eagle. The entire lake will be closed to all water uses including swimming, boating, and fishing on the day of treatment only. Furthermore, water from the lake cannot be used for livestock watering for one day following treatment or until July 18th. Drinking, cooking for three days or until July 20th and irrigation for five days or until July 22nd. Information about the treatment products being used, sample labels of products can be reviewed on HTTP, uh, colon backslash www.lakeshirley.com. The work is being performed for the Lake Shirley Improvement Corporation pursuant to a permit license issued by MassDEP, Office of Watershed Management, and the Lunenburg and Shirley Conservation Commissions. The treatment is being performed under contract with Solitude Lake Management of Shrewsbury, Mass. And their number is 508-865-1000. Thank you. Anybody else have any announcements? Uh, no appointments. We do have a couple of resignations. Uh, I will read them both for the record. Uh, so the first one is from Rebecca Lantry, who's uh, resigning from the Historical Commission, effective June 18th of this year. Uh, dear town manager and select board, I regret to inform you that after 21 years on the Historical Commission, I am retiring from my service to the town of Lunenburg. Since 1999, I have worked hard for historic preservation of homes, roads, and the town center of Lunenburg for our community's sake and for our country's sake, so that we could understand our history through this genuine New England community that was the home to the patriots who fought in the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, and on to two world wars and now COVID-19. I'm proud of my efforts to put into law the demolition delay bylaw and the architectural preservation district for the town of Lunenburg. 
I, mourn, I mourned the loss of every historic building and park we lost on the journey to get these laws into place and the struggles to get them right and effective. I regret not being able to get the funding piece of community preservation in place with the adoption of the Community Preservation Act for the town of Lunenburg. But after three attempts and finally being blocked by the selectmen to even put it on the ballot, this is a battle for another day and another member of our community to raise the charge. Sincerely, Rebecca Lantry. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Ms. Lantry for all of her efforts over those 21 years and all the efforts that she says uh, being part of these delay bylaws in the architectural preservation district. She brought a wealth of energy and knowledge to, to this and really fought for things she believed in. And uh, I think she did, did a wonderful effort. So I'd like to thank her publicly. And of course, I would like us to uh, present her uh, a letter that we all would sign in uh, thanks for her service. Yeah, I would like to also say thank you 21 years on something. I mean, I know what three years feels like for like, uh, so thank you for that. And then we have from uh, Dave Passios, who's resigning uh, from the Board of Health. He addresses it to the chair of the Board of Health and myself. As required by our local charter, I wish to inform you that I will be resigning from my elected seat on the Board of Health, effective 5 p.m. Thursday, June 25th, and shortly thereafter be sworn into my newly elected parks position. I will also remain on the two appointed committees that I hold seats on, namely the TC Passios Design Committee and FinCom. After approximately nine years on the Board of Health, I'm looking forward to turning my energies toward the many challenges ahead for our local parks. Respectfully, Dave Passios. Again, I. I will thank Dave for his service there, his continued service on those other committees and his newly elected position. And again, issue a thanks for his service on the Board of Health. And we have some town manager appointments this evening. There's muted Tom. No, I'm unmuting her. There you go. There we go. Selectman Adams had referenced the town beach at the beginning of the meeting. So this relates to the decision by the Parks Commission at their meeting this past Thursday. They voted to open the town beach on July 13th. Um, so this, these appointments were added to the agenda so they could um, open as quickly as possible, um, including training the employees prior to opening. So the, I'm asking you to ratify the following appointments. Jen Nass for a beach coordinator, Elizabeth Simeone for a seasonal lifeguard, Paige Gengler for a seasonal lifeguard, Ethan Gengler for a seasonal lifeguard, Cheryl Shaw, seasonal lifeguard, Lynn Major as a seasonal lifeguard, Kina Kelly as a seasonal lifeguard and Jared Bowser as a seasonal lifeguard. I would entertain a motion to those town manager appointments. So moved. Okay. Okay, so we have a motion to ratify the appointments and we have a second. Any further discussion? Uh, Ms. Adams. I raised my hand to make a motion. Oh, but. okay, gotcha. Okay, any further discussion? Um, I would just say I'm excited um, to see the town beach opening and um, I ended up doing private lessons this year, but for years, my kids um, have gone to the town beach for lessons. And um, so I'm pretty happy to see that it's moving forward. I agree. All right. Any other discussion? Seeing none, roll call vote. Ms. Adams. Aye. Mr. Dwyer. Aye. Mr. Marino. Aye. Mr. Jeffries. Aye. And an eye from myself. So please, Madam Town Manager, relay that those to the Parks Commission and they when they open the beach next what is it, Monday it opens? Monday. Monday. So they'll have people and of course notify all the people who are just appointed. <clears throat> Do you know if they're offering swim lessons or is it just opening for recreation? I'm not sure. I wasn't able to watch all of that meeting on Thursday. So not sure what part. 
Maybe Mr. Passios can answer. Uh, I don't know if he's listening right now or not. Oh, he does. He is raising his hand. So let's unmute Mr. Passios. There we go. There we go. Dave Passios, 56 Whiting Street, uh, Vice Chair of Parks Commission. Uh, in answer to that question, no, there will not be lessons offered um, this year at the town beach. With all the limitations, uh, it's going to be very difficult just to have the public on the beach. Um, if uh, Just so everybody knows, the uh, YouTube video of the meeting was posted finally today. Uh, it's a two and a half hour meeting. So uh, if you want to hear all of the discussion, be ready to sit down with a cup of coffee or something because uh, we were on for quite a while. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, current business, the FY20 school bus transportation payment request. I see we have the superintendent and the school business manager with us. I'm going to unmute both of you just to make sure we can hear you. Mr. Cassidy, can you hear us? I can hear you. And we can hear you. And Dr. Burnham, can you hear I, us? I can. Thank you. Okay. I will let either the town manager or, or either uh, Dr. Burnham or Mr. Cassidy start. I can just give a brief introduction. Um, so recently, a new change in legislation allows for payments for service contracts that weren't allowable under the previous law for services not rendered. Uh, so our two transportation companies, D-Bus Service and Vanpool, have requested payment for services um, during this time based on the cost that they've had to incur uh, during the shutdown. So um, if either the superintendent or the school business manager wants to take it from there. I think Mr. Cassidy can handle this. Um, he has been the lead on, on this particular issue that we've been um, looking at for several months at this point. Thank you. Uh, through uh, Madam Town Manager to the Board of Selectmen, um, good evening, I'm Mike Cassidy, I'm the business manager for the Lunenburg Public Schools. Uh, thanks for uh, uh, the invitation to uh, discuss this matter. Uh, I just want to alert uh, the, the Board of Selectmen, this has been an issue that uh, the, uh, the school department has been uh, aware of and dealing with since the closure on March 13th. Um, it, but, but as things developed, uh, there, there was hope. Uh, you know, toward the end of March and the beginning of April that we'd be coming back and, and the closure was going to be just a couple of weeks and perhaps those bus companies could have uh, covered those costs during that, during that time. Ultimately, the, uh, the, our, uh, our school district closed classes. There was no transportation needed for our students. Therefore, um, uh, DESE, the Department of uh, uh, Elementary and Secondary Education, uh, was really advising business managers uh, to form collaboratives and, and meet with uh, uh, their vendors. So, uh, so let me just give you an example. So our, uh, there were 13 districts that were dealing with a D-Bus company and trying to negotiate some sort of uh, uh, reduction of uh, what was left on our contract. So while that was going on, and there was a lot of back and forth as far as what um, uh, what the, the vendor wanted to pay and what uh, we, we thought was fair uh, based upon um, some of their um, uh, direct costs. Um, the, the, at the beginning of June, there was a lot uh, uh, or a bill that was that was signed into law that allowed districts uh, to, to pay vendors uh, for services uh, similar to uh, transportation. So uh, basically services that, that weren't received uh, to support them, uh, part of their operation expenses. This is, uh, for me, 
Uh, this is very unusual. I've never seen anything like this in my entire career. Um, so, uh, I, I, as it as it happened, it was it was it was sort of a relief for a lot of the districts uh, dealing with that. But one part of that that law was once a uh, a fee or a negotiated amount was uh, determined, that amount had to be approved by uh, the uh, local school committee. It had to be approved by the, the finance director for the town. And it had to be approved by the city council or board of selectmen. So th this is the process. Uh, I'll, I'll alert you that uh, on June 17th, uh, the superintendent and I uh, move forward a recommendation to the school committee to pay a portion of the remaining contract uh, for our two vendors. Now, our two vendors are D-Bus Company, and they are, are a big yellow bus company, and they transport our uh, general ed students. And then our second uh, vendor is uh, Vanpool Transportation, and they transport our special ed students uh, in district and out of district. So at the June 17th meeting, the school committee uh, voted to approve that uh, the D bus company uh, receive a payment not to exceed $94,000 and Van Pool Transportation not to receive a payment uh, not to exceed 41000 120, excuse me, $41,112. Um, for the school committee, it was a tough vote. The very, un, uh, very unusual circumstances that are tied to payments to these vendors. Um, I mean, I can, I, uh, I can speak to the vendors and the quality work uh, that they do for the district. I know that, um, uh, for example, D-Bus, most of the, the bus drivers that, that drive our uh, students in Lunenburg are, they live in Lunenburg, and then there's an additional 24 employees that, that live in Lunenburg as well. And the, uh, I didn't get the number of employees, for example, that live in uh, Lunenburg, but I know that uh, I, they told me that they were going to give me that information. I didn't have it, but... So, uh, so why why should we pay them? I think part of it is um, you know they'll tell you um, that it, it's it's to support their operating expenses as they were um, uh, as they were ready to go. And as I, as I started my conversation, there was hope at the beginning of this whole process. In, at the end of March and the beginning of April, as we kept on delaying, that we were going to ha have buses rolling um, if this pandemic didn't go the way it did. So they, they were on guard and ready to go. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. So there's a cost to that. Um, they've outlined costs that um, uh, both vendors, uh, you know, talk about... Um, employee training, they still have insurance, uh, they still have uh, leases and rentals for the, their, um, their fleet, whether it's small buses or large buses, they're still paying uh, those, those, uh, those lease payments for those new um, uh, pieces of equipment. Um, so it is an unusual vote, and it is a tough vote. Uh, it's a lot of money. We're taking this uh, this vote very seriously as we present it to you tonight. Um, but probably the most important thing that we want is to make sure that these vendors are ready to go when we're, uh, kids are ready to be picked up in some way, shape, or form on September 1st, 2020. Um, a number of other districts have uh, provided uh, some support, uh, similar to the percentages that are being proposed here tonight. 
but th that's them and we're Lunenburg and we have to make our own decision whether whether or not this is right uh, for Lunenburg. I'm not trying to sway you or, or put pressure on you while well, other districts or other towns are doing it. I'm just saying it, it, it's happening. It has happened. Some districts haven't paid. So I just want you to be aware of that too. But it, um, you know, Jesse has, has noted that our transportation companies are our partners in education. They're there. Uh, they support our students. Mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're not our vendors. I mean, excuse me, they're not our employees. They're our vendors. They're under contract. And they're there for us. They're there for the students. And they take transportation safety of students very important. So that is uh, where we are right now as far as um, the process. The school committee has voted. They have brought that information. Uh, uh, we brought that information forward to the uh, the town manager uh, to go forward to the, the board of selectmen. So the next step is a um, is a vote uh, for consideration uh, for the board of selectmen. Uh, Madam Superintendent, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to my comments uh, before we get to maybe some questions. No, I would just echo your comments that they uh, both companies are truly partners in in our in our work to educate the students. They have been um, very dependable and reliable, um, and they definitely work with us to find solutions when when needed. Okay, I will open it up to the board, Ms. Adams. Um, sure. Um, I have a question, um, and it may be a question we don't have the answer to in regards to Vanpool and the bus. There were a lot of um, governmental stimulus money to help small businesses compensate with losses. So the first question that comes to my mind in terms of looking to pay them in terms of sustainability and um, you know, the fact that they had insurance and things they still needed to pay for is one, do we know if either of them received any um, stimulus money? And in regards to their employees, have their employees been on um, unemployment, in which case there was actually more than regular unemployment there. I'm not sure how it worked because I was fortunate that my job, although I lost a lot of hours, I would, kept it. So I'm not sure how it works, but I know some people on unemployment got more than usual. So perhaps their drivers were on unemployment during this time. Um, in which case, if, if they're getting the money from the town, are they in some case maybe, you know, having an opportunity to have more than usual if they've gotten any stimulus money or um, unemployment payment? So uh, th that's a good question. We've, we've batted that around with the vendor. The, the, the proposed amount, that is is still pending in Lunenburg is going to to their direct uh, costs, and uh, you know, like I said, it, it's not going toward uh, salary and wages. Um, I just want to I want to look down here on my notes. I just want to let you know that the um, uh, D bus did get uh, payroll. It's called the PPP, mm -hmm. which is the Payroll Protection Program. And, and they were able, with that amount, they were able to keep their employees on the payroll for uh, so many weeks, but they could not keep them on for the entire closure period. Okay. So the money that they, they, they received went straight to the, the employees. Uh, once they ran out, they did lay them off. Okay. Uh, we're speaking uh, with Van Poole. Uh, they, uh, they were not eligible for that uh, PPP, uh, but they did get some uh, an $8,000 credit uh, to, to help uh, uh, offset some of their, their payroll expenses. But ultimately they did, uh, when that money ran out, they did furlough their employees. And I think that was at the beginning of May for Vanpool. So, uh, they, so they did get some, um, you know, whether it's, 
stimulus money or they got some support from from some uh, places. I think the example it was insurance, not necessarily a, a stimulus money. Uh, but they 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 got the money. They continue to pay their employees, and then they ultimately laid them off or furloughed them. I'll just go back to what I was. Uh, our our support here is not to pay employees; it's to pay and support their operating expenses um, during this closure. Okay, Ms. Adams, does does that help? It does, because that's where my immediate thought went to is hopefully businesses, and, and obviously this has been the biggest concern of all of this is small businesses and how it impacts them. But my questions, like from this perspective, go with, and, and I like my note I jotted down is what are our municipal problems down the road? And, and there's going to be financial problems, state aid problems. And will we look back at this moment when we're making our own cuts and we're having to make some choices, maybe cutting transportation, um, down the down the road, literally, um, we might have to say, okay, we need to make these cuts. Okay, we need to charge the citizens for busing. And so anything we give now to this, which sounds idyllic on the surface, I think harms us later because we're all going to be impacted by um, the missing money, the mi missing tax revenue. Um, you know, I think a lot of people are still in a holding pattern and we haven't seen the economic impacts of a lot of the things that everything sort of froze. And so I d don't know what it's all going to look like. Um, like real estate, everyone wants to leave the city. So maybe real estate's getting, you know, more valuable out here. So we don't know if it's all going to be bad or if it's going to shift. But my, my thoughts are that I, I think we got to be very careful with our money. And although it's nice to give it you know, to maintaining things, that it might harm us in the long run, even with transportation costs. So um, th those are my immediate thoughts is hopefully they've been able to survive this as a small business in the way everybody's been asked to do. And maybe we need to save our money. That's sort of my instinct. Okay. Madam town manager. Oh, you are muted. Thank you. Um, just as to speak to Selectman Adams, question about loans or grants and stuff. That's part of the new legislation. A requirement is they have to submit a sworn statement about the monies they have received for in form of grant or loans. Um, so it would be reducing that financial amount by that, uh, those additional funds that they've re received. Thank you. Mr. Jeffries. Yeah, thank you. I have a good evening. First, thank you for explaining the, the situation. Um, the, I have a couple of different questions. So uh, for the town manager, for, for both Michael Cassidy and also for Kate. But the first question is who, just so I'm clear, this money is coming out of the school budget, right? Correct. Last, last year's school budget. Yeah. Last year's budget. And, and just as a just to recap what I believe I heard as part of the process that's been approved, uh, this requires our, normally this would not require this to come before us, but because of the uniqueness of the circumstance, um, we have a vendor who's requesting payment for, for services not delivered. So I just want to be clear that that's what we're discussing, right? All right, and and I think that that's been obvious, but just want to clarify that. So my next question is for the town manager, and I'm just I'm looking at my notes over here, which is I you know I, I was looking at for an email that we received from um, Dean Tran, Senator Tran, back in May 15th, and just to read a portion of this message that he sent over to us, um, it said um, you know we have in the Senate we're working hard to try to come to some numbers and guidance that we can convey to the municipalities. Uh, the Senate and House have been in consultation with well-known firms such as Mass Budget, LA Clayton Matthews, Mass Taxpayers, and Centers for State Policy Analysis to come to a realization of the numbers. Um, they are still to be determined. We also um, we we also have to look at historical data such as the recession in 2009 and 2010. In that two-year recession, local aid was reduced by 28.8%. Special education and regional school transportation were reduced by 42.1% and 
and 30.5% respectively. Due to the pandemic, today's economy is even worse. So with that backdrop, uh, I, my next question is to the town manager, which is, do we have any information from the state on how much of that 9 million we've anticipated or hoped for are we really gonna get? I believe she's on mute. Yep, I'm, I'm on it. I see. <laughs> we do not, the state has not come up with a, a budget yet. Um, the governor passed an interim budget, which is essentially our fiscal 20 state aid number for our July payment. And uh, if it's not done by August, I, um, I'm under the understanding that it would be the same for August as well if a state budget is not passed by then. And just as an aside, Mr. Jeffries, if, if the, the 2008, 2000 through 2010 is any indication of how long it took them to come up with a budget then, I wouldn't expect a budget before the end of August anytime soon. Yeah, and so my next question then really is looking looking at this context in which the schools are roughly 60 something percent of the overall town budget budget. And if we're looking at a $3 million reduction, I wanna keep these numbers simple. If we're looking at $9 million anticipated in state aid, and if we expect a three, uh, a 30%, 33% reduction, that's $3 million less. So then a department that is 62% ish of the budget, we can roughly say that that's more than half of 3 million. So can the schools absorb a $1.75 million reduction without cutting teachers? <laughs> so if, I mean, it looks like the answer is no. So if the answer, that question, no. if the answer to that question is no, then I'm not in favor of, of approving any money to go to a vendor who's, who's having an unfortunate time because of this crisis, because we may very well be in this position in three months from now, and they're getting in early before we know the real numbers, and they're going to make sure that they're good to go. And then we're going to be the ones who are looking at how we get, how we come in with a gap for two to $3 million. And we're going to, and there's no way from how I sit where we can do that without cutting people. Okay. Mr. Dwyer. Well, first I'll, I'll ask if Mr. Cassidy or, or Dr. Burnham have any response to that or anything they want to comment. Well, it wasn't really a question. It was more of a statement. Okay. Mr. Dwyer. Well, there, was a, there was a question there, which is just to clarify from both of you that you cannot absorb a $1.75 million reduction without cutting teachers. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Dwyer. Um, just a clarifying point um, to Mr. Cassidy, uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, when school transportation services were stopped, that was March 13th, correct? Correct. That was the last day. Okay. And when was the official uh, school closure date when you knew transportation services would no longer be used? When was the last day that, what was the first when, when did you When did you inform the companies that uh, the school year was canceled? I, uh, Dr. Burnham, I think that was sometime in, in April, right? Uh, as we were, as we were getting messages from the governor, as far as, um, uh, so it, it was toward the end of April. Okay. So well, I, I generally agree with Mike, uh, Mr. Jeffrey's point on this. I will say that if the two companies were on standby for a period of time, whether it be you know a month or, or 45 days, that portion of the contract that they were on standby and had to be ready to provide services, I, I would entertain uh, approving compensation for that period. Okay. Uh, I have some questions. First, can you talk to us about the company? First of all, what year of the contract are we in with them? And when the bids went out, how many companies provided a, a, a response to the request for a proposal for transportation? So we're, we're about to embark in year two of a three-year contract with D-Bus. 
So in September, it'll be year two of a three-year contract. I will, I, I will alert uh, the, uh, the Board of Selectmen that that bid also had uh, two one-year contracts as well. So we will make a decision at some point in year three whether or not we want to renew uh, year four and year five. Uh, at, when we bid that, we followed all uh, the Chapter 30B requirements, uh, advertising locally, uh, uh, advertising in combines, um, but we only got one vendor to uh, submit a bid, and that was D-Bus, who was our previous ven uh, bus transportation vendor. Okay, so if I, so it's not like we had a lot to pick from. And again, just playing uh, certain scenarios, if this company were to, regardless of whether we fund them or we don't, but if, let's say just in the scheme of things, they don't have enough money to continue and they, they close shop, what would be the impact to Lunenburg schools at that point? At that point, it, it would, uh, we would be moving into an emergency bid process and, and um, you know, we, we've we've talked about that uh, uh, the, the cohort of uh, business managers, and you know, they, they're if they go under, I mean, there's a possibility that another company would buy them. Whether or not they would honor uh, existing contracts is really unsure. It probably depends on the type of uh, bankruptcy that they would uh, file for. But if uh, um, so I think it was a few years ago, uh, did, uh, uh, the, our transportation company, this was before I, I joined the district, but uh, a, a, a vendor, a, a bus vendor uh, ended up folding. And then uh, D-Bus uh, stepped forward and provided transportation until uh, the district could provide the uh, uh, transportation services. So... If they go under, uh, it's an emergency bid um, and, and try to scramble to get uh, transportation for kids for the first day of school. Okay. So it, it causes another obstacle. Right. Okay. Uh, th 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 that could be disastrous. So two, two other, two final questions for me. Can you talk about the percentage of how the percentage that you're that you're presenting to us that you're recommending and you recommend it to the to the school committee, how you calculated that percentage? How was the? How did you go through what their expenses were? Uh, what was the percentage, and how did you come to the final number? So we, uh, so I wasn't part of the negotiating team with the business managers with D Bus, but we did get. Um, a uh, operating uh, expenses, and uh, we had uh, estimated, um, you know, uh, not not including, uh, you know, gas because that would be uh, that would be a cost that that wouldn't apply here. Um, removing much of the uh, uh, the bus driver's salary. We came up with about 45% of the operating expenses. Um, there was a counter uh, by, the, by the vendor, um, and uh, we were trying to cover some of the, the costs that, uh, uh, that are made by the vendor as it relates to some of the extracurricular um, services that they provide to the district, such as, you know, uh, athletic uh, busing, uh, after school busing, uh, field trips. So we came up with an additional 5% at that point. And it, so that, so it's 45% are removing some of the, the costs that they um, uh, are not incurring during a closure and removing uh, the salaries for bus drivers. And it, it came down to about 45%, and then we adjusted up 5%. Okay. Uh, to assist them with the extra, extracurricular services. And my last question is the, the plans for what's going to happen this year and what kind of scenario school in general across the country, but in Lunenburg is going to have that uncertainty. Have we come up with a plan with them 
so we don't revisit this? Have we negotiated what, what might happen if this similar thing happens here? Or if at some point in the year there's an outbreak and we have to close schools and do the homeschooling part again? Have we talked about how that would work going forward? Because there is a likelihood that that could happen. It, it, it's very likely. So I, I'll, I'll, I'll reference a, um, a district-wide task force that the superintendent of schools has, uh, has developed. Uh, I'm meeting with the transportation task force uh, tomorrow morning or tomorrow at noon to talk about some of these scenarios. You know, we're, we're coming up with really uh, three different plans. What does a, 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 a hybrid transportation plan looks like? What does uh, normal, we'll call it normal. I don't know what normal is anymore, but just the regular, what, what transportation was uh, six months ago. And then the final piece to that would be if we uh, close, if there's a if there's a period of time, um, if there's a closure, what are the expectations of the transportation company, and what will be the expectations of the district? So, I don't have any of those answers yet, but we're we're engaging in conversations with both companies. Uh, Tomorrow, they're part of the, of the big district-wide task force. We're uh, nailing down some of the details uh, starting tomorrow. I just, and the reason why there's just a little bit of delay on this, I mean, it, we've been, these task forces have, have been moving forward. We haven't got any regulations either from the federal or the, or the, uh, or the state government as far as their guidelines or mandated um, separation of students. So the, the, basically what we're going to be talking about is some preliminary ideas tomorrow, but those guidelines are forthcoming. We've been told by, uh, by Desi, uh, as soon as we get that information, uh, it, it will be a heightened conversation with our vendors as we move forward. Uh, two of my, two of the members have additional questions. I just have my one comment after the series of questions. My, my concern is I want obviously them to their to be a transportation company to provide transportation for the school. On the other hand, so I think that something should be negotiated. I'm a little concerned, and that's only because I'm not as familiar with the numbers, so I'm relying on, on the numbers that are being presented and discussed here. But everybody's going to have to take a hit from, this, from, from the pandemic closures. And what I don't want is for them to be made whole and nobody else is made whole. So they should be able to share in the burden. And Right now, I would be honest in saying I'm not really sure that that's true. It may be true. I don't know that it's not true, but I don't know that it is true either. And that's the balancing act as far as uh, from my perspective. Ms. Adams, and then Mr. Marino after that. Sure, just a couple follow-up. Um, one, you know, we're talking about the um, negative impact of a potential, you know, company going out of business, and we're really hypothesizing that. And so um, I don't want us making decisions based on a hypothesis because we don't really know anything um, in regards to their, their business situation. Um, and I understand that they were on standby, but it wasn't as if um, we were preventing them from finding another opportunity. The whole world was on standby in a really awkward way. So I would feel much differently about them being on call for us if we prohibited them from another opportunity. And we didn't. There was no opportunity for anyone to have to grow or change their business. And so although they were waiting for us, we were all waiting for everything. Um, and so in that case, if we had prevented an opportunity, I'd feel responsible for their loss, but we didn't prevent um, an opportunity. We were all suffering under the same circumstance. And then I always like to look at anything, especially in government, in the form of consistencies. And it goes with something that Chairman Alonzo just said, um, you know, we could face these things in the future. Um, what if we're closed again? And we set a precedent. Do we help private businesses every time there's a crisis? And the answer is we certainly can't do that. We're not a charity. And so in regards to being consistent, um, are the food distributors looking for us to pay for food we didn't buy? Just as one example, 
the trickling effect of people being harmed by the school not functioning can be looked at in so many different ways. You know, did we not buy as many paper towels for the bathrooms? How are those suppliers doing? Um, and so if we're willing to give municipal money to one private company as almost like an act of charity, are we able to provide that to other places that might be suffering? And that becomes inconsistent because it doesn't sound like we are. I would feel safer just finding a protective measure that we have to be careful with our own money and certainly everybody's suffering and it would be nice to take town money and make sure that everybody feels okay. But that's not something we're in the business of doing. We have to protect ourselves. Okay. Mr. Marino. Um, to you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mike, nice to see you. Um, I'm just trying to understand this whole situation. Now the school entered into a contract with the bus company. Is that correct? And they signed a contract, and you're in your third year of a four-year contract? They're in the, the second year. Uh, in September will be year two of a three-year contract. Okay. And I, I, the way I understand it, the, the bus company was willing to make concessions in terms of that contract, even though you signed it. And, and by signing it, that means that the school is obligated to pay the contract. Am I correct? The way it sits, but he came back and made uh, he, he made uh, concessions because of the the situation that everybody's in. Is that correct? Uh, may, may I ask you to repeat that question? I, 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 it came in a little broken up. I didn't hear all, all of that. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. Um, so I'm just trying to understand uh, clearly. The, the school signed a contract with the bus company and you're in your second year or third year, right? Yes. So you're obligated to pay them. Am I right? They came back and made concessions because of the COVID situation. So they opened the contract back up. So, so, you know, as far as contract execution, I, 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 I've always done it this way, which is, um, you know, take buses out of out of uh, the situation. If we were doing an elevator maintenance contract, um, if if the vendor just doesn't show up, we're we're not. It's it's a service contract. We're not going to pay them. The they didn't provide uh, so many days of transportation to our district, so they wouldn't be entitled to specific. Uh, uh, amounts in the contract it's so it's a service it's not a supply so if if our paper towel company didn't provide um uh if we just kind of strop the orders for paper towels um you know we didn't need them we would we wouldn't have to pay for them or if they if the vendor couldn't provide them so i i just want to be clear that the uh, we are not we are not obligated to pay this this balance the town when i say we are in the town of lunenburg i just want you to understand that this special legislation uh, uh, allows districts to compensate these bus companies for services not rendered so um th that's the difference Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, that, that makes it much more okay. clear. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Ms. Adams. Um, sure, question for Mr. Cassidy. Um, the special legislation where this bus company um, uh, option to pay them for services not rendered, are there other companies in this special legislation that would come down the pipeline looking for the same type of charity or is this specific to bus companies? Basically, do they have a big lobbying group? <laughs> I don't know if I can answer that question. Uh, I was just really so focused in on uh, uh, Madam Town Manager. Do, would you happen to know that? Yeah, well, I, I think one of the other um, partners that they would have wanted us to to um, provide some payment to would be. Um, those out of district placements.
for students. Right, isn't that correct, Mike? Yeah. The legislation um, came about because of, primarily because of this issue. Um, and it, but it was the language, I believe, related to service contracts. That's how it's written. Right. Mr. Jeffries. So, uh, it's, my, it's my feeling, and I am, I, I do not know this legislation inside and out, but I don't think there's going to be a, um, a, a group lining up behind our bus companies looking for some sorts of payments. Thank you, Mr. Jeffries. No, I think it's, it's I think this is such a such a difficult conversation and it's such an unfortunate situation. You know, I think that the um, schools, unlike the other departments, or the school, I wouldn't say unlike, I'd say the schools un more so than other departments, is really, while, while providing, while doing what they do, they also really create a sense of community. Um, and the people that work with schools, organizations that work with schools, you know, I can understand that there's a feeling here that, you know, here's a, here's a vital partner, and they're in need. And um, they're, they're being very clear that they're in need. They're providing affidavits that they're in need and they're asking us for help. <laughs> and I understand that that's really difficult. It's difficult. Um, you know, I, I, I also have to think, you know, I'm also thinking five months down the line, while there's a, if we're in a situation where we don't have enough money and now we have to cut positions that, you know, how many teachers, you know, there's so many options on the table with furloughs and et cetera, but that this a hundred and I think it's 30 something thousand dollars in total, the 94 plus the 45 of them, right? How many people, how many teachers are we going to be able to hopefully potentially positively impact with that money alternatively? And if, you know, and I think on that side, it's, it's a teacher. I am trying to see someone in front of me saying, but I'm the one teaching the kids, you know, I'm the one that's there every day. And you guys gave the money to a contractor and you didn't have to do it. And I, and I think that I, I, you know, I, we don't really have much to do with the schools as you know, and nor do I think we should, um, I feel badly this one, but I feel very strongly um, that we that you really shouldn't spend the money. Uh, can I ask is is D bus service uh, and Vanpool contracted with, and and what have they what have those communities do do have they done on this regard? Do you have the answers to that? I know. Um, uh, so I'm just going to rattle a couple districts off. Um, so Clinton, Littleton, Tingsboro, Westford settled at a 50 percent. Uh, and that, that went through the school committee and board of selectmen. I got word that uh, North Middle School Committee approved a payment last night. So it's. Um, and as far as Vanpool goes, they, they are between 48 and 78% from, uh, from some of their districts. Uh, it, it, it absolutely varies. So. Um, part, of the, part of me leans also onto the fact that, again, as Michael said, it's difficult, but there is a certain risk. Nobody, you know, the act of God clause in all these contracts that nobody, nobody, did this to anybody else it just happened to everybody at the same time it would be it seems to be that they should especially with the number of districts you just mentioned i'm guessing there's probably more uh, they're a sizable organization they should be able to get some kind of contingency loan to to basically bridge the gap until things are back to normal and uh, certainly the district and the municipality really doesn't have the ability to do that uh, we can't go to a bank and get a loan for our school department or whatever. So uh, that also leads into the situation and the discussion. We have two members of the finance committee who would like to speak. I'm, I'm, 
leaning toward letting them speak here, even though it's not. I'd like to hear from them. Sure. All right, Mr. Passios. There we go. You're right with you. Mr. Beardmore, you're next. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Apparently, my uh, camera is shut down on me. Uh, Dave Passios, 56 Whiting Street. Uh, officially speaking, as a uh, citizen of Lunenburg, I am a member of the Finance Committee, so some of the concerns come from my membership on that committee. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I actually have a question to each Mr. Cassidy and uh, the town manager, and that is, uh, can you, Mr. Cassidy, first of all, can you give us an approximate dollar amount of our total contract for transportation on an annualized basis for the school district? I'm trying to get a comparison between the total dollars we put out for uh, transportation to these two companies versus the uh, outlay that we're talking about here. And my question to the town manager will be, uh, are any of these costs reimbursable because they are dire directly related to the fact that we did not get services and related to the COVID situation? I'll unmute the town manager and whoever finds their information first, go ahead. So the, uh, I, I can tell you our, um, hold on. Oh. I can't get the numbers. Just, just bear with me a second. So I'll jump in then. Okay, thank um, you. <laughs> yeah, I, I do not believe these would be cost reimbursable because the whole um, premise of the CARES Act funding is that they were for unbudgeted expenses related to COVID-19. So we specifically have a budget for transportation costs that could cover the six months. Okay, thank you. So our, our transportation budget is, is $1 one hundred and sixty six thousand dollars per year okay the reason <laughs> but so the, you know second to, uh, the, that cost i mean our our big expenses are health insurance transportation and out of district tuition right so okay that, that is about five percent of our, our operating budget all right uh, the reason I needed that number is that, um, correct me one month, one way or the other, uh, DTAN Transportation uh, and the other vendor uh, provided services to us through the school year for approximately seven months before everything was shut down. Is that a correct number? I'll, I'll agree with that number. Okay, and then uh, the remaining time period would be three, three to four months. Uh, assuming there's no transportation or very little transportation over the summer months. So they provided services for 70% of our normal transportation season, and they will be paid in full for that, I'm assuming. What, uh, they, they're not looking for, uh, to, uh, to get the full amount, no. Town manager, I think, has a different take on it, if I may. I, if I'm interpreting what um, Mr. Passio's question is, is they're being paid for the months that we were open. They, Without any adjustments. Correct. So prior to the shutdown, they were paid in full for right. those. So, right. Is that where you were asking? Yes. Yeah. So I was just trying to get a correlation between, you know, we owe them definitely for seven months in full because they provided the services. There's a three month period here that we're talking about now that they did not provide services for that they're looking for some compensation. Uh, I haven't run the numbers because I didn't have the, uh, the total number, uh, but I just want everybody to 
understand that we're covering expenses for basically a three month period with whatever is decided to uh, pay out, if anything, uh, to these two companies. Um, that's all I have right now. I, I may have a calculation later, but I don't think so. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Beardmore. Good evening, uh, Peter Beardmore, 282 Pleasant Street. I'm a member of the Finance Committee, and I also serve as the Finance Committee liaison to the School Committee. Um, service is a pacing item in our school department, which means if we don't have them, we can't do our job in the school department. So if there's any risk to them delivering that service in September, I think. Lost him. And Peter, we have lost you. It's another question mark for our administration to have to deal with. Um, and I, I, the questions that you should be asking as a board of selectmen is around assurances and financial stability from D bus service. And I haven't heard any of you ask that question. I've heard questions about laid off teachers and, and all kinds of financial doom and gloom, which I've been accused of by members of this committee. All the incumbent members of this committee spoke against the amendments that Dave Passios and I made a town meeting to try to be financially conservative going into the next year. These are items from the last annual budget that are unappropriated, that if we don't spend them, are gonna go into free cash. And, uh, and I don't think you're asking the right questions. So maybe you need to go get more information and table this until you have a, a full, the, the, the information that you need. Because right now the posturing strikes me as, um, inconsistent so far thank you uh you do have the floor so if you have questions you'd like to ask instead of spending the time criticizing the board for the questions you don't think we're asking this would be the opportunity to ask those questions well mr alonzo you've already asked questions i believe about the financial condition of debus service and i don't think we got the answer okay um but i would ask you know, are there any assurances that come with this money? Um, as opposed to some of the other towns that have decided not to participate in this, uh, in this funding scenario. I would pose that question to Mr. Cassidy and, Ms. and Dr. Burnham about the question from Mr. Beardmore. Do, do, what kind of assurance do they give us? We give us the money, they, we give them the money, and are they gonna continue the services or do they get the money and something else happens anyway? Well, uh, you know, that, that's a discussion that I would like to have with, with the town manager. Uh, I, I mean, I have a strategy not to, not to pay them until we absolutely know the buses are running on September 1st. So that payment wouldn't be made. So I'm going to interrupt you there because I'm going to ask you a question because I, I thought of this question earlier, which is, Okay. When is when when do we have to decide this? This is before us tonight, but this is well before we're going to start school in two months or a month. Yeah, I mean a month and a half, whatever the, the actual time is. But when do we have to make this decision? So I'll, I'll defer that question to the town manager, but uh, it, it's it's probably. Uh, uh, the, the, like I said, it, with the money is is encumbered, so I'd be looking for the town for guidance on that. This is not uh, 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 there's no deadlines in the legislation on when this can be paid. Okay. Or the, there's no guidelines uh, from Desi as far as uh, you know it has to be paid by a specific date. Obviously, payments should probably align with uh, you know final payments. Uh, for FY20. I mean, I'm inclined a little bit to have that instead of instead of you presenting what we've spoken to, I'd love to see, hear their pitch for themselves, why they believe we should pay them any money. 
Uh, so, Mr. Marino, you've been very patient. And you muted yourself. Okay. All right. Um, uh, with respect, Pete, to respond to your comment, I, I, I'm trying to understand what's going on here. And uh, I guess one of the questions I have, if has, somebody hasn't asked it already, is that could the payment, uh, the payment to the bus company be used in advance of services delivered by any chance? In other words, next fall or this coming school year, um, we may be facing additional busing uh, to comply with the you know, distance, distancing and so forth. And I'm just wondering if that was something that you've already considered, you, you're, you may be uh, in negotiations with the bus company on that issue. So as far as additional services, uh, that conversation is, is likely going to start tomorrow mm -hmm. with those bus companies. And, um, you know, my big question is uh, the distancing, is that going to going to involve additional buses and bus drivers, which would drive our you know, price cost up in our contract. So, um, you know, if, that, if we go to a, some sort of hybrid model with less students, we might, we might be able to um, not incur a lot of additional costs. Now, it's my understanding the, the money that is encumbered uh, for these two vendors are strictly the services that were rendered or not rendered in FY20. That money cannot be moved forward at all. Right. So. Ms. Adams. Oh, hold on, hold on. You had muted yourself. Let's, there you go. Okay, thank you. A few comments. One, um, we're dealing with the bus companies, which are a private enterprise. Um, even with our money, um, there's nothing to prevent them from closing their doors, going out of business. I know there's a contract, but I mean, they're a private, a private company. They could receive our money and then close up shop in September. Like, so there's no guarantees. So, so I just, that, that's what I really focus on is things like that. They can collect money from the municipalities for the services um, not provided. And it doesn't mean they're going to stay open. We can't force a private company to stay open. We can't force a private company to exist on our behalf. And so I really like to make that disconnect that although it would be nice to um, help sustain them, that doesn't, that doesn't, create an environment where they will exist just for our needs. There may be other reasons we have to look for emergency services um, like has happened in the past. So it certainly doesn't prevent us from um, having to look at transportation issues in the future. So handing over the money, um, I, I don't think necessarily ensures that we have a positive transportation outcome. That's just, you know, sort of out of our control. Um, also, um, in reference to a previous speaker talking about capital items and the need to save money, there's one very distinct difference. The capital money allocated to pay for air conditioning improvements in the primary school, which are much needed and will help with respiratory health, we will receive the air conditioning in the primary school. So the money for the capital items will result in capital improvements. So we will get the services that those money are allocated to pay for. There's a real distinct difference here is that somebody's asking money for something that didn't happen. Those capital items were asking to be delayed in such a sense that they'd still need to be paid for someday. Um, and, and some of the things were for emergency, um, you know, um, um, apparatus and things like that. So it's very, very different to fund capital items of which we will get versus funding something that didn't happen. Um, I don't think, I think there's no right answer. I think that's the most important thing. So in terms of implying that there's any type of posturing, I think everybody has gone through this horrible experience in a different way. 
And so anybody who has an opinion, even if they're opposite, I don't think is, is trying to posture. I think they're trying to navigate their concerns. I would be with some comments that um, Selectman um, Jeffries has brought up in the sense of, of money's money. It'll pay for one thing or another. And if you don't have it, you'll lose one thing or another. And if the 137,000 could keep two teachers, um, what happens when we have those conversations, what classes get cut? And I'd rather be protective of our money and hope that everybody makes it through. And I want, I want our staff and our municipal employees to be one of those things that makes it. Um, and even if we throw this money at the bus company saying, we hope, we hope you're better off because of it, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that they can't sell out their business and, and move on from busing. So I, I, there's certainly no posturing. It's just opinions based on what we've all been through in, in different ways. And I think we have an opportunity to save a little bit of money. We got to save money because one thing I know is that we're hypothesizing a bit, but I'm certain there will be cuts um, because of cuts in state and state funding. So we're, we're pretty naive to sit here and not try to protect our own money. Mr. Passios, I'm going to give you one more word. Go ahead. There we go. Uh, yeah, uh, the premise that uh, detransportation is going to go out of business, uh, I, I don't think, again, that should be uh, drive this conversation or decision. Uh, whether D stays in business or doesn't stay in business, uh, if you're concerned about busing for the next school year, one way or another, there's going to be a bus company or an entity out there busing students because with the number of towns that D uh, covers, someone's going to step in, whether it be the state or whatever, and create, even if they have to create a transportation entity uh, to transport students. Uh, so I don't think that should be part of the conversation. Um, I had run some quick numbers while the conversation was going on, but I think I made an error on it. So I'm, I'm gonna leave those numbers alone for now. Um, uh, my only question would be, is it suffice to say that even if we pay out uh, the approximately $135,000 that we're talking about right now, um, that there will be a substantial balance in the transportation line item that will flow to free cash. That's kind of a different question than what we've been talking about here, but um, I, I'm, I'm just thinking that there's a sizable amount of money above and beyond uh, what you're proposing to pay the bus companies that is not going to be paid out that must have been budgeted because it was contracted. Is that rolling to free cash? Okay, I can tell, um, I can tell you that uh, the surplus funds were used for two things. Uh, uh, purchase of some Chromebooks district-wide and then the district paid for some pre, uh, prepaid some uh, out of district tuition to help offset some of the costs for next year. Okay, I apologize to remember that conversation from uh, a previous school committee meeting. Thank you. Okay. So it sounds like Mr. Cassidy, there's a lot of questions that you, you, you're going to be having upcoming meetings about and discussions about. Uh, personally, and I'll, I'll you know leave it for the board to decide, but personally, I am in favor of tabling this and not coming to a vote. I think if we were to vote today, I think I know which way would the vote would go. Uh, I, I personally, and I think I've heard it from other people, but I personally am not convinced. I'm not, I'm probably much more in the middle than some of the other members, but I'm not convinced that they've made their case about why we should pay them the money. I'm sorry they're in the position they're in, but you know what? I could probably point to 40 million Americans who feel like they're sorry for the situation they're in too. So, um, I would like to help out and maybe to some degree, but I'm not convinced of the number or the need at this point. If they want to make that case, uh, I'd be more than willing to put this as an agenda item in a future selectman meeting, but I'll leave it to the board to, to discuss that. Ms. Adams. Um, I have two things. Um, one, I was going to make a motion, but first I see that in our general comments, there's, like a comment from a guest. And I know we were taking comments from um, the public. 
And so I didn't know if we wanted to pass along the question. I don't know if you can feel, see. Feel free to read it. Um, someone has asked, has legal looked at the contract in terms of the act of God typically favors the vendor as if D could have run their bus routes and picked up nobody? I'm not sure. So does everybody, do the professionals agree that the reason why this state legislation, special legislation was passed was because it is agreed that the school districts did not owe that money to the school transportation companies? Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Exactly. So that answers Mr. Menard's question, that everybody agrees that contractually we did not, we are not required to provide it. I, if, if, if I didn't say that uh, directly, I apologize. I thought I did. No, but no we have no obligation to pay this. Right. Um, oh, you did say it, but I think okay. this, this person joined late, possibly. Mm -hmm. uh, but you did say it. Anyway, even if they missed it, it was asked. And so at least now they know. I mean, does the board feel like we should table this? Or does somebody feel strongly that we should vote on this now? I don't want to give false hope. Um, I don't think that I'm, I don't. I don't think that even if they came convincing us that there was a need that my thought on this would change, that I'm really concerned as Selectman Adams has noted about our employees. And I really don't, you know, anything we can do to lessen furloughing, um, cutting, reducing pay. And I, I don't see how we can get there doing something this town to my knowledge has never done, which is pay $135,000 plus to someone who didn't do anything for us. I mean, I think that there's a lot of residents who would stand up right now and say, can you ask, set up a fund for $135,000 for me not to pay my taxes? Um, and we would say no. So I don't, I don't think, I don't want to give false hope that next week or in two weeks from now, I am persuadable on this, unfortunately. Any other members? Ms. Adams? Yes, no, I think um, this time was unique, uniquely um, different for everybody. A lot of people had, you know, negative impacts, certainly running for Google Classrooms from home while working from home, using our own resources, ink, paper, um, buying extra supplies, um, really acting about four hours a day as an instructor of education in my home, um, with that taking away from my ability to work on my own ability to work. There, there's enormous strains that were put on everybody in different ways. And, um, you know, that's like if I'm going to, as a, as a parent, ask the school, can you compensate me for the extra resources I'm using at home? I mean, everybody can look for ways to say, I need to be compensated because this was a uniquely challenging time for me. And so although I'm completely empathetic to small businesses, I've tried to spend money locally at small businesses when I need things or do takeout. And that's the way I've tried to help um, because I am afraid for small businesses. I think we're all here as, as um, representatives of the municipality, which in its own sense is its own business. And we need the municipal money to make sure we protect the municipal business just as they need money to survive. We need money to survive. And so we can't be in, in a position of charity, in my opinion, that our municipal town is our business. We need to protect it too. We need that money too. And if we give it out as charity to one person, why not another? Maybe I could have a thousand dollars for school supplies um, in case we go hybrid again. So if you start looking for opportunities to support and help people who have unique challenges right now, the list is gonna be very long. And we're on that list as the town of Lunenburg. And so I'm with Michael. I just feel so strongly that the town needs to protect its money in a time of potential financial crisis that how this experience has, had, has made me feel. And when I put on the hat of Selectman and think of Lunenburg, I think if we have an opportunity to protect money, that that's our responsibility in this role. Um, as a private citizen, I could write a check to D-Bus uh, companies and worried, but not as a Selectman. All right. No so one else can hands up. If that helps us. I, so, I would entertain a motion regarding this request. 
Um, okay, I would make a motion that we deny or do not approve um, the, I don't know what they formally called it, but the, um, the payment to the bus company for the services not rendered. Second, and I would have to ask you to amend that to also include, and I'm blanking on the name of the other company that was just sitting here in front of me. And sure. Yes, I amend that to, to the bus company and to Vanpool. Second. Okay. Any further discussion by anybody? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to throw you, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Comment. I, I, you know, I, I, I don't think we should vote on this tonight. I think we should look into it a little more. I, I want to understand why the other cities and towns just opted to pay that bill. Um, there's, I mean, I understand, I understand what the school's going through. They're, they're stuck between uh, Sillier and Charybdis here. You know, they're damned if they don't, damned if they don't. The bus has got to make it to the school in the fall somehow. The kids got to get to school. There won't, there won't need, be need for a teacher if the, their teachers if there's no kids in the school or if we can't get them there. So I get it. I understand their position. And I think I don't think we should rush the judgment here. I think we should take some time here and understand why other cities and towns just opted to pay it. There's got to be a reason behind that. And the second thing is, I you know, I, I it's a lot of money. And I think that and I don't know if it's possible, but to negotiate with D-Bus and see if they can give them some kind of concessions during the uh, beginning of the school year so that we can get some value out of that money that we spent uh, or that they intend to spend or want to spend. Um, you know, payment and advance of services kind of thing. Uh, because, yes, I, I get it. They didn't they didn't have to move the buses. I mean, they have a lot of expenses uh, that are associated with the, you know, keeping those buses going. They pay interest on all the buses. I know, I know what it's all about. It's expensive just to keep them and run a business, even though they're not moving. Um, so I, I, that's my opinion. I don't think we should rush into this. I think we should talk to some of the other cities and towns and see why, what their logic was. Uh, you know, I, I feel like, uh, you know, maybe, maybe they know something we don't know, or, you know, maybe we can, Maybe we can make this thing work somehow in, in everybody's favor. But the bottom line is we have to provide transportation for the kids in the fall. We're not doing them any favors. We're not doing anybody any favors by not putting money into the economy. And everybody knows that. Uh, any, any economist will tell you, we keep the economy going. We got to keep this working. We got to keep money into the economy. And, uh, and so I, I just don't think we should rush into it. I personally think that we should table it as well as I suggested, because again, I'm kind of in the middle. I, I probably could be, if depending on what their case is and what information Mr. Cassidy comes up with in meetings that are upcoming, uh, I could I, I could see myself a light going on that says, yeah, that's a good point. I think some other good points have been made today, but I think it's, I agree with Mr. Marino that it's premature to vote on it now. So I will be voting no on on this motion, not because I'm in favor of paying it tonight. I just in favor of tabling it for another meeting. Any other discussion? Mr. Chairman, uh, I agree with you and Mr. Marino. I'd like to table it, uh, not because I'm decided on the issue, but I think we need some more information that will be forthcoming with the, the upcoming uh, meetings between um, the vendors and, and Mr. Cassidy and, and Dr. Burnham. Okay. I withdraw my second. Okay. Well, would somebody change, change change the motion to tabling it? I mean, again, it, we're not agreeing to anything. All we're agreeing to is to hear more information. I'd like to make a motion that we table this later date. Do I have a second? Second. Any further discussion on that? Let's do a roll call. Ms. Adams. Go ahead, no. Mr. Marino? Yes. Mr. Aye. Jeffries? Yes. Mr. Dwyer? Aye. And an aye for me. So four to one, we are tabling this. Uh, let us know, Dr. Burnham and Mr. Cassidy, when you have more information. And I would make the case that uh, I think it's incumbent upon a representative from D-Bus, not necessarily through you, but to make the case to us as well. I'd like to know from them 
And I think to Mr. Marino's question, uh, if we can get more information, this is to the school department and to the town manager, if we can find out why the other towns decided to do it, I think it's a valid question to see what their reasoning is. I, I, I agree with Ms. Adams that I don't want to be involved in a charity thing, but I think it, there is something about keeping partners stable and, and uh, making them available for services going forward. So I think there's a lot of components at play. Mm -hmm. I want to thank Mr. Cassidy and Dr. Burnham for joining us tonight and thank you for the discussion and the presentation. Uh, I know it's a trying time for, for all of us and I want to send my uh, appreciation for you guys taking the time tonight. And thank you thank for you. your consideration. Thank you for your consideration. I know it's a tough vote and it's, it's very, um, there's, there's a lot of emotions behind it too. So thank you for your consideration. I look forward to coming back and, and talking about this some more. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> okay, next agenda, uh, agenda item is a statement regarding cemetery preparation this past Memorial Day. So I have a prepared statement regarding this issue. So it's on the issue of cemetery conditions over the Memorial Day weekend. One of the purposes of the town charter is to distribute authority of how the town is run by spreading it over many elected and appointed boards, committees, and commissions. These bodies create the policies and regulations under which their particular sphere of influence are to be run. The implementation of those policies and regulations are relegated to the hired employees of the town who are under the supervision of either the town manager or, in the case of the schools, the school superintendent. Again, these determinations and delegations are clearly stated in the charter. In short, elected bodies promulgate policies and regulations and employees implement them. No entity has all the authority or oversight to run autonomously. For this all to work, there must be clear, concise, and frequent communication between all involved parties. Without that communication, nothing can be done which will satisfy all parties and meet their objectives and the collective objectives of the town. Such is the case with the deplorable condition of the cemeteries over this past Memorial Day weekend. The one thing that has been agreed upon by all parties and the public was that this was a complete debacle that embarrassed the town as a whole and disgraced those who the holiday commemorates. It was completely unacceptable and must not ever be repeated. The town manager and the assistant town manager and HR director have undertaken their own inquiry in determining what occurred. That involved personnel matters that cannot legally and will not ethically be discussed at an open meeting, including this one. Instead, this statement provides a broad overview, not of that inquiry, but a, a broad assessment of assigned responsibilities and how lack of communication is at the core of the problem. First, the charter directly states that, quote, the day-to-day -day care and maintenance of the cemetery shall be under the supervision of the town manager. Since 2001, that supervision has been delegated by the town manager to the DPW department under the direction of the DPW director. Since this responsibility has been under this department for 19 years or so, and as it is an annual event, the responsibility first and foremost lies here. As the Memorial Day weekend approached, it would be expected that the condition of the cemeteries and their preparedness would have been discussed, determined, determined and planned by the DPW director with his staff. Clearly, this did not happen. Next, there exists a cemetery superintendent who, as the job description states, quote, works under the direct supervision of the director of public works, performing skilled work regarding independent judgment and discretion, unquote, and among whose essential functions are to, quote, maintain cemetery buildings and grounds, supervising and performing mowing, grading, loaming, seeding, shrub and tree planting and pruning, to operate tractors, truck mowers, trimmers, and other various equipment, perform minor and preventative maintenance on equipment, unquote. As someone who spends most of their time involved with all the happenings at the cemeteries, it would logically follow that the superintendent would have known that the cemeteries would not be properly prepared for the holiday. Yet that message did not seem to be communicated to the proper people. Lastly is the elected cemetery commission. While a cemetery should always be well-maintained to the best of the town's ability, Memorial Day especially spotlights them. Again, it could reasonably be expected that they would check in with someone, the DPW director or cemetery superintendent, to make sure all would be ready by Memorial Day. These multiple checkpoints should have been sufficient for the problem to be recognized and remedied by the holiday. 
Uh, however, this did not happen. And sadly, it did not happen because the communications between these parties is, for the most part, almost non-existent. And so the problem was left unaddressed until many in the public were outraged by what they saw as they went to pay respects to the graves of their loved ones. Some posted on social media, and that is when I was made aware of the issue on Friday evening or Saturday morning of the holiday weekend. I immediately asked the town manager about it, who also had not heard about the issue before I brought it to her attention. There was an attempt to scramble people into action on Sunday, but the work to be done was too great and the time too short. South Cemetery was mostly completed, but North Cemetery was not. The conditions were rightfully decried by the public and the search for the cause was launched the following week by the town manager. After con careful contemplation, I am certain that many, if not all of the parties involved, knew that the cemeteries were not going to be ready, but for whatever reason or reasons, did not work together to resolve the issue, nor did they alert others, such as the town manager or the board of selectmen, who might have intervened to get the job done correctly and in time. I refuse to speculate or project intentions as to why that happened that way, but it is clear to me that the statement is nonetheless true. In the end, finger pointing will not be productive, but reminding everyone what their assigned roles and responsibilities are might be. Additionally, broken discussions with all parties to work with them in drastically improving their communications and expectations among themselves are in order. The town manager has already worked to have them create a one-year work plan detailing all the cemetery tasks, projects, and holidays to be addressed over the next year. All parties have received and accepted it, and the town manager will periodically check in to ensure things stay on track. This single event may have revealed more serious problems among these parties and the town manager and, the, uh, and a board of selectmen representative will reach out to schedule a meeting with all cemetery stakeholders to see if we can set things back on a more even and constructive course. While that is underway, we expect everyone to be on heightened alert to any further issues that the cemeteries might face and ask everyone's cooperation in writing this ship. Uh, Mr. Jeffries. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, statement. As an update on kind of where we're at, uh, you know, based on all available information, um, I, you know, in, in addition to what you've stated, I, I believe that, you know, there's, there's a, Last week, and I'll say this as a side comment here, but it kind of goes to the point. It, it very much goes to the point. Last week, I took a vacation. I took the week off, and it was the first week I've taken off since December of 2018. So it's been quite a while since I've taken some time off. I do work a lot. And one of the things I did was I went down to the Massachusetts National Cemetery in Bourne and visited my father's grave. Um, who, he died three years ago, and I've been down there three times so far. And it's 700 and I think 80 acres or something like that, and it's gorgeous. It's a gorgeous place, and it's peaceful. And, you know, it was raining, and I stood out there in the rain, and, and it, was, it was a moment that had a lot of meaning to me. But what I didn't question was whether or not things were well-maintained because they were, you know, I, from my perspective, this, this situation that happened, it, it, it's not just a deplorable, it's, it's a really bad staffing problem from my perspective. It, it blows my mind that we maintain cemeteries and have been doing so for, I don't know, 200 something years. And we are at a point now where something as serious as Memorial Day happens, and we have a DPW director and staff and a commission that don't work well together because there's not there's a trust issue with whether or not there's confidence that that if something is brought up as a problem that there will actually be a resolution for it. It, it blows my mind that we're in a situation where this even occurred. 
Um, the town manager should not be sitting down with staff going over a yearly plan of what they should be doing when we've had someone in the job for as long as they've been in the job. So I, I want us to be, from my perspective, certainly I understand we don't need to point fingers here, but there are management tools that prevent these situations. 30, 60, 90 calendars, meeting with board and committees and saying, this is what we've done in the last 30 days. This is what we're doing in the next 30 days, the next 60 days, the next 90 days, that you have this kind of group collaboration. When these things occur, it's obvious that that's not occurring. That's a management problem. Staff have the responsibility to support these elected boards. I read the Cemetery Commission's guidelines. They're crystal clear. They just weren't followed. It is not on elected officials, in my perception, to have to go to staff who are, per the charter, responsible for day to day operations and ask them to please do their job. So I certainly think that, you know, how this happened, we know how this happened. We know how this happened. This has been years in the making. And I think we have a responsibility now to do something about what we all know is a problem. Ms. Adams. Um, hi, yes. Um, in regards to this, I have a couple questions, but I'll start with the comments. Um, there certainly has been cemetery stress involving um, oversight um, employee relations that go back for me at least two years. I attended in the spring of 2018 a cemetery commission meeting, um, and this grievance and these confusions were discussed at length for hours that evening, um, and that was two years ago. Um, and so I definitely think it's not like we woke up one day and the cemetery wasn't mowed. There's, there's um, employee allocation problems since there was consolidation of parks and cemetery. And a lot of people have spoken about them and asked questions. And even if departments are consolidated, the responsibilities shouldn't be um, removed from the places of which they were intended. So there's definitely um, you know, a, a history of concern getting to the point where something's not met, and I'll echo um, what Selectman Jeffrey said about um, visiting cemeteries recently. Um, I was at St. Leo's in Lemonster. All four of my grandparents ended up, you know, um, uh, being buried at one cemetery, and um, it was really beautiful there. Like, it, it's a very active cemetery. I know that sounds weird to say, so there's lots of um, um, flowers being planted, and it's actually more of like a garden. Um, but when you're there, you're thinking of your loved one or, or taking care of their site. And, and I, I don't know what it would feel like to go in there to see them and come across something that looked neglected or, or de dejected. That's certainly not something I think we want to provide for um, the people who um, are buried here, or the people who visit their loved ones here. Um, they're very unique spaces. Um, in regards to the statement that was read, it said we may have uncovered a more serious problem. I didn't know if we could um, be more specific. That's very general. What problem was uncovered besides the lawn mowing? And then you had talked about a group getting together with a selectman representative um, who will discuss it further. What is the group? Who is the representative? Um, we, haven't, we haven't discussed we haven't discussed it's okay. like that it represents. And I didn't know if there isn't something that we can work on um, as a group um, that, that might help um, make sure that everything's um, going to have a good outcome for everybody involved. I mean, the representative could be a whole, I mean, it's, it, it's in the works. I mean, it could be the whole, the whole board if people wanted it to be the whole board. Okay, because like we didn't know it was in the works, so I just in that part of it when it said there. Proposed here, it's not. It's I don't want to. I don't want you to get the impression that it's in the works. I'm proposing it here that it it has in dialogues. It has been discussed. Nothing has been discussed about setting a time or who the people would be, except the people that are obvious. Because I think it'd be easier for the community. It's always better as a board if we just keep things on our agenda and keep things in our meetings, so we can get everyone's input. Well, there are some meetings that make it difficult in the public eye because they involve personnel things. So that, that becomes difficult. <clears throat> That's why one representative may be better. Uh, again, anything that involves personnel becomes a tricky discussion. Okay. 
Anybody else have any comments on that? I guess just what's the next steps? Like, I mean, we've just sort of, I feel like we keep verbalizing the same grievance or concern of the cemetery commission or the conditions, but what, and, and maybe my questions for Heather, um, in regards to the charter, the day-to-day -day operations really go to Heather and then she can allocate them to other people. So it really, it, it, it falls under, you know, Heather in the sense, do you see, um, a pathway, and I know you've begun working on it, but for a more global positive, you know, outcomes in these space, like I said, the conversations that are being had are the things that people are worried about with the cemeteries not being taken care of or not having um, the time or resources allocated to them. It, I've heard the same conversation um, at length two years ago, and here we are. Um, so, so how do we, how do we bring better outcomes to the cemeteries? Well, the crux of the issue, um, like Chairman Alonzo said, is communication. And so that will be my focus with staff is to improve those lines of communication and to make sure everyone's on the same page. And working with the Cemetery Commission is a key piece of that as well. I also want to comment uh, to those who have visited other cemeteries. I mean, you can go to Mount Auburn Cemetery as well, as well as the two that the other selectmen have mentioned. There's probably lots of others. You know, the, 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 the cemetery conditions that happened on Memorial Day weren't anything except uh, people dropping the ball on responsibilities. But the look of the cemetery, even if it was mowed, I mean, the look and the, the feel of the cemetery is a budget issue. I mean, you could you could make it look gorgeous if we just put a lot more money in it. And you could certainly make the argument, and I think it's a feasible argument, that we should take better care of the cemeteries to make them look look better than they are. But that would be increasing budgets for, you know, seeding and irrigation and watering and all these things and bigger staff. So that's something that the town as a whole has to decide whether they want to do. But this issue had to do with a specific thing that was avoidable. We weren't talking about that the grass was brown or that there are bare spots. That's, is, we're talking about like calf high weeds not being mowed. So I just want to be clear on the, the, the difference between those. Mr. Jeffries. Yeah. And I also want to be really, you know, I want, I, I'm, I, I want to be clear in my criticisms that we are, um, I don't think that we have a structural government problem. I disagree with that um, suggestion. I think that the way that the structure is, is in my opinion, works, can work very, very well. Um, you know, it, it's just, we're going through a time where it's not. And, and I, and, but, Ultimately, though, I think that a lot of there's a lot of people as you think about the cemeteries, you think about these, you know, the roles, you know, because we're talking about DPW, which is a very complicated role in which they're interacting with with buildings and roads and parks and cemeteries and sewer. And it's too much. It's too much on one plate and buildings. And, and it's also different visions. You know, when you're talking about roads and parks and this is all short range here and now type stuff. Things that need your immediate attention. Grass has to get cut about every week until around now, and I can go 10 days or so, but up until now, every week. You know, um, you know snowstorms happen, that's a now thing. Buildings are long-term plans. And they're things that are gonna be here for 30, 40 years or, or, or 80, 90 years. And the skill sets of managing the two are very different. And I say that as someone who manages property for a living you know and i think that the the end state of where we need to get to is 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 probably in some senses more consolidation in certain areas um but certainly i think we have a good structure um with having a, a sole person that can work with these similar departments to get to a, a good result you know if you remove the facility aspect from dpw and, and you put that underneath its own umbrella that lightens the load up. And it also gives you a different skill set there of saying, hey, buildings, long term, parks, cemeteries, sewer, you know, all the service issues are, are now. 
when you need something with a building that's in 15, 20, 30 years, but everything else in DPW is now. And I think that that's the pathway for how we get to a better point that, you know, uh, perhaps some of the problem here is that we, we delegate things to the town manager because we need to have someone who can fire. Um, and let's just call it what it is. We need to have someone who, who, who's overall responsible, who can say, you didn't do your job, you're being terminated. So, but it doesn't realistically mean that, that one person can possibly do all of these things. So there has to be delegation to others. And, you know, I think that in general, there's a lot on the plate of the town manager. I don't think that this is a necessarily a poor reflection of, of the town manager's performance. And I don't think this relates to overall government management. I think that this is a, this is, this is an isolated incident, uh, an isolated management problem. Let me just not say isolated incident, isolated management problem that we need to address. Okay. Okay. Let's move on to current business number three, discussion on House Bill 4820, addressing voting options in response to COVID-19. We had some documents in our uh, Google Drive regarding this. So I don't know if anybody missed Ms. Adams, hold on, I have to unmute you. Yep, go ahead. Okay, sorry about that. I just had a question in terms of our last agenda item. Is it going back on our agenda or are we, because we the memo had talked about a group getting together, selectman representative, are we furthering the work on it or? We will, well, we could, we could take an action to uh, you know, choose someone to, meet with the town manager and the, and the parties, the cemetery commission and the DPW director, we could just not have the board of selectmen in it at all. I think the town manager has met with the three parties uh, uh, already. So. Yeah. I'm just looking for like conclusion or follow-up based on, I know um, I read an email from a member of the cemetery commission and just in the sense if somebody says, well, what's a next step or, or what is the town doing? And if somebody was listening or something, what, before we leave that agenda item, what's our next step? Well, I think my statement indicated that there's going to be the, first of all, there's the year plan and the assistant town manager and HR director is going to work with the, the, the three entities involved to try to improve communication under the supervision of the town manager. So that I wanted that out in the public. I also wanted a public statement from the Board of Selectmen because we have heard on numerous occasions public comments regarding this. So I think in and of itself, it is a completion. If we if the we of the board want to get involved in this, and there's no necessity that we do, if we trust the town manager and the assistant town manager, there's no need that we do. I offered that as a, a potential uh, meeting point just as another elected body. So Okay. Okay, so the solution is just that Heather or the assistant town manager, they're actively working on improved communication on tasks related right. to the cemetery. Right. Correct. And interpersonal relationships. Okay. All right. I just wanted to, I felt like the statement implied there was further action and I just wanted to define what that was. So, okay. Thank you. I have a clarifying question as well. Are, Heather, um, excuse me, town manager Heather. To the, Heather, the town manager, just so I'm clear, are, this action plan that's been created, um, are, am I correct in, under, in assuming then that there has not been a calendar of a year of what needs to be done at the different parks and cemeteries until a week ago? Not to my knowledge. Not in writing. Right, not a formalized one, right? Okay. Take two, a House Bill 4820, addressing voting options in response to COVID-19. I believe, Mr. Jeffries, you asked for this to be on the agenda. Let me go ahead and pull it up. And this was just for the board's um, knowledge. This was signed into law today, I believe, by the governor. Yeah, yesterday or today, yeah, one of the two. 
And of course, I get kicked out of the drive just as I'm uh, pulling this stuff up. It's basically a 20 page document legislation that says that for this year, for a special election, for primary elections, and for November elections, you can vote by mail and they're going to be sending. I don't know if they're sending ballots or requests for ballots to everybody. I, I, I didn't get the distinction, but that's so, all going to be covered in cost by the state, I believe, by the, uh, well, that's there's an unfunded mandate. <laughs> I'm sorry. Heather. No, go ahead. So there seems to be someone, I think it would be better if you spoke to it, Heather, because it's an unfunded mandate and you did the research on that. So, well, I'm not entirely clear whether, there, what type of funding there is because um, we reached out to our, our legislators about this to see and ask that question about would this be funded through the state for reimbursement in, in other similar situation when early voting was mandated, the state offered reimbursement for those costs. Um, what the response was, yes, there will be uh, reimbursement for that, but that was prior to the bill passing. And I was on a weekly call that the Lieutenant Governor does every week today. And the now that the bill passed, the Secretary of State's office is, they have a short time frame right now to get out ballots to everyone and put out uh, release information on how any reimbursement is done um, and that it there may be eligible costs through the CARES Act. So um, CARES Act funding that the state receives. So we haven't seen anything definitively of what that is going to look like. And to clarify for people at home, because I don't know if we, uh, just a state will kind of restate what we're talking about here is that this is what's come about in the last couple of months is different states have tried doing different things in terms of voting to see um, to help increase turnout. And no matter your political persuasion, um, what they're finding consistently is that if you proactively mail ballots to people rather than then, rather than them having to ask for them, that the turnout is overall higher. And so you get a higher participation rate when you provide people with the tools to participate. Um, yeah, it's kind of circular. So that's a, um, that's what's coming about. And the question is who pays for those actual ballots that, uh, I reached out to, um, Kathy to ask her about the cost, um, per election. And it seems a little high and not, not like it's abnormally high, but it's not something that we can certainly just do, uh, without having to, uh, have money allocated for it. So it would be very interesting to see what's developed in the coming weeks about funds. Mm -hmm. I will go on record. I, I've had this discussion with the town manager, of course, that uh, we go on record as saying, I think this is an absolutely terrible idea. I think mail-in voting, widespread mail-in voting is fraught with so many problems. I, I could list them off readily. And if, if this is just for this year because of the pandemic, fine. But, you know, the, the more the more hands that a ballot touches both going to the voter and coming back from the voter is just fraught with all kinds of custody problems. <laughs> and the fact that people are going headlong into this, I mean, Mr. Jeffries talks about turnout. Well, actually it decreases turnout. It tells people don't turn out. Now turnout means you come to vote, not that you vote because there's no actual record that any of these people who send in ballots are actually voting. Uh, they, they, their signatures may be on them, but other people may be voting for them and having people sign. I mean, there's a, just um, even in the news this past week was the town of Grafton where they found a whole stack of uncounted ballots in, in some back office. You know, And then on top of that is they're going to increase the time of early voting there's going to be a complete overrun of mail-in votes. So those have to be counted. So when did we find out? Did we find out three weeks, four weeks after the election, who won? 
in some places. I mean, Lionel Lunenberg is small compared to other places. I, I just think this couldn't be, this is not a very uh, good process. They don't talk about security of the process and the trust in the process at all. All they do is talk about mail-in votes and timelines in this whole legislation, and nobody has addressed any voter security and, and the trust in that the outcome can be trusted. Um, so, I think we just have to refer to how many times you had mail stolen out of your mailbox. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't, we don't think we don't know. know. <laughs> <laughs> would be I mean, who's been right. waiting for that check and didn't get it? You know, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know if we have a chronic problem of people busting into mailboxes to vote and, uh, well, we, we haven't put something there like this for them to steal. So we yeah. have no data point. I mean, you know, we do. We haven't given people the opportunity to look for opportunities for voter fraud in this way. So there's really, I mean, somebody might have stole my tank top from Target today out of my mailbox, but <laughs> I'd rather them have that than my vote. Yeah, so I, I think there's a lot of unknowns, but it's, it's to be determined. But I think mail is generally pretty safe. It's, but it's, it's well beyond the mail process. The mail process doesn't have to be intentional. So mail gets lost often, gets re sent to the wrong places, gets shredded in machines. So there's that. But it's the custody beforehand and afterward. So people are going to be sending in things two weeks early. They have to be stored somewhere unless they're in a safe where people are guarding them. There's people who have access. Yeah, there's just, it's, it just can be really, again, intentionally and unintentionally. I don't want to give just the idea that somebody's out to fix an election but just even unintentionally it's fraught with with potential screw-ups so ms adams i agree that the chain of custody is impo impossible to really see yourself through when you take your ballot and you feed it into the machine you get the sense that it's you know there's oversight you see people watching it go into the machines the um people at polling sites are there you know as an uh intentionally um um, you know, groups from both political parties. And it, it just feels like a safe place. Um, you mail your ballot back in, like you never see it go somewhere. Um, I just had a family member have the USPS lose track of a, a multi-thousand dollar shipment that was from here to New Hampshire. And it was last seen maybe in Missouri. Um, and so, I mean, if that can happen to a huge expensive um, shipment with insurance on it, um, I don't know where my vote goes this day and age. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of things to think through and there's probably a lot of ways people can think to manipulate the situation in the terms of, you know, is what they're receiving, what I sent. I don't know, you know, it's hard to say, but it does seem like there's so many changes happening so quickly because of the virus. We don't want to lose sight. Increased pr pr participation because you've, you've changed the rules or the way you're doing it isn't necessarily a good outcome. Increased participation is always a good outcome if, if people make the choice to participate. I don't necessarily think that we're obligated to provide participation. I think an important part of voting is people choosing to vote. And there's a lot of different ways to do it. And, and to clarify, I think you know, we have to really read through this legislation, but some of it does say that, you know, that it is like an application that's being mailed to you that you have to respond to to get your ballot. And so I don't, I don't think this is as, as clear cut as your ballot just shows up in the mail and one day poof, it, it, <laughs> it's not there anymore. Like it is a participatory process. You do have to respond. Okay. Uh, vote to petition the state legislature for home rule petitions for the investment of library trust funds and the additional all alcohol liquor license for Jack's Country Variety, both which were voted at the town meeting. So Article 17 and 24. So what do you need from us, to, Madam Town Manager? Do we just need our approval to send this in? Correct. For the board to vote to authorize you to sign this letter. Um, as drafted by council, and it's sent to our uh, delegation. So it's a very short letter. Everybody should have received it. Anybody have any questions about it? Anybody want to make a motion about it? 
All right, make a motion that we vote. Is this to allow Chairman Alonzo to sign? Is that correct, Heather? Correct. Mm -hmm. um, the letter which will petition the state legislation for the home rule petitions for investment of library trust funds and for the additional all alcohol liquor license for Jack Country Variety. Second. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? Um, I have to abstain from the vote on, I'm going to abstain from the vote on Jack's because of previously existing business relationships, but I would like to just vote that I'll abstain. You don't need to change the motion, but I do support the article for the library, uh, even though I'm not going to vote for that. Do you want me to read it as a separate motion? Does that and make you do, it, one, it, it, it doesn't matter. They're, yes. they're both going to pass. So. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so let's just leave it in here. Maybe. <laughs> so let's find out. So Ms. Adams. Uh, aye. Mr. Marino. Aye. Mr. Jeffries. I abstain. Mr. Dwyer. Oh, Mr. Dwyer is muted. Mr. Dwyer. Aye. And I for me. Okay. Committee, Board of Selectmen Committee appointments. So we had a list, one of seven lists given us so I by Elaine. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we'll just go down the list. And if people are interested in serving on these, we will entertain those motions and pass them. So the first one on the list, which was um, was filled by Damon McQuaid as a capital planning committee. Um, I would be willing to serve on this as long as this meeting time at 5.30 on Tuesdays is adhered to. But I would be willing to serve on this um, committee. I am also willing to serve on that committee. All right, it's a race. All right. <laughs> do I, I do I, are we doing are we going to uh, do one of these? Yeah, we're gonna do one at a time, right? Oh, oh I'm sorry. I thought I thought we were gonna go through and may I recommend Oh well, okay, we can we can go through and see what we get. I okay, C C Pasios uh, building design committee. Surprise. Yes, I, do that. I know Katie, Katie is interested in that. Anybody else I, interested in that committee? I'd be interested in serving on that committee as well. Oh, this is going to be a fun, these are going to be fun votes here. Finance committee, appointing committee. Uh, I'm currently on that. I would like to stay on that. Not that it has a lot of work. We just want to have vacancies. Uh, Massachusetts Regional Planning Commission. Currently is Katie. Are you willing to stay on that? I'm willing to retire from that. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody willing to join the MASH, the MRPC? I'll do it. If Excuse me? The only taker. You'd actually be good for that. You'd know right what they're looking for. That's a good fit. There you go. She's selling it to you. <laughs> yeah, I, I think so, too. I was on it for the planning board, and I think Jim, Chief Marino would be perfect. And the Doyle Center is a really neat place to meet, so... If they go back to real life. Okay. The Massachusetts Joint Transportation Committee currently has no member. Um, and this one is unsure. I'd be happy to serve on that. Okay. There we got Todd. The Metropolitan Planning Organization, the MPO. I am willing to serve on that. Okay. The MART, which was Phyllis, the MART Advisory Board. I cannot do anything that's during the day because I, of my employment, my job. <laughs> All right, that looks like no one. And then Stormwater Task Force. Uh, I'd be willing to serve on that one as well. Um, with my serving on conservation as well as select board, we come up with that. I've had to deal with those issues a lot on conservation. Yeah, I was going to say you'd be a perfect fit for that by, you know, yeah. by employment and your uh, conservation. So yeah, that'd be that'd be yeah. excellent. Uh, all right. So the only ones that didn't get anything was uh, MJTC, which doesn't have a member currently anyway. Um, 
and the MART Advisory Board. So now we're going to actually go through these. So again, because of their timing, I can't, I can't do a Thursday meeting because of prior commitments. And so the only two I can do are the capital planning and finance committee appointment committee. But again, I know Michael wanted to do that. I'm not married to it. I just want to spread, spread the responsibility as much as we can. Yeah. I mean, Tom, I'm kind of with you on that too, in the sense that um, MPO being on a Wednesday in the middle of the day, it's, it's a little challenging for me. Um, but I, with my work calendar, I can certainly make that work. Um, but it's also scheduling for me. I can't do Mondays or Wednesday meetings, period. So uh, Tuesdays, I'm not beholden to being, uh, I'm not, I think you'd be a great fit for it. So it's not uh, something that I necessarily am jumping up and down about. Uh, okay. But it just, it also is a very few that I can actually do. Yeah, uh, me as well. So, well, we need, we need nominees and, and seconds and to, unless we have a unanimous decision. We don't have to vote if there's a unanimous decision. So Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll remove myself from that. That seems pretty unanimous then. All right. So anybody have any objection to me being on the Capital Planning Committee? No. Nope. All right. Okay. So now the TCP Building Design Committee. So we had, again, two people who were interested in it. This is tough. <laughs> um, can, can I ask about your, uh, Todd, just real quick, your professional background? Uh, sure. Um, I, I'm a professional engineer, a geotechnical engineer. Um, and in my career, I've actually had quite a few opportunities to work on, on school uh, projects and, and repurposing of school facilities. Um, they can be challenging projects. And oftentimes when you're dealing with, you know, architecture and engineering firms there, um, there's a lot of jargon that goes on. And I think I can add a, a valuable voice to that committee as, as with my engineering background, as well as um, being on the select board. So I'd be happy to serve. Katie. Um, hi, yes, I just wanted to speak there. Um, although, you know, backgrounds and, and such, there is um, currently an engineer um, who's also a member of the TCP BDC. Um, and then there are the, um, you know, people that we are paying to um, be the engineers and the architects. Um, what I noticed when we formed the committee, um, one, it's all men. Um, there, there's not a single woman on there or mother, would I say. And what really draws me to the project is um, just, I've spent many years working on the um, concept of town buildings, how to use them. And somebody said to me early on, because in a lot of ways I oppose the project, um, that a lot of times it's good to have the perspective of not just those who support it or, or understand it, but also the perspective of people who see it a little differently because even if the project moves forward, looking at it from a devil's advocate point of view or looking at it from a different perspective will only make the final product better. Um, I have four children in the school system and what brought me into town government was working on a student safety and security problem and um, working on school resource officer and surveillance cameras. This building will very likely involve um, an eclectic group of people coming together. I always worked on it from safety from the point of view of children. Now we have safety of the point of view of um, pandemics and things like that. I have a background at my doctor of pharmacy background in healthcare. Um, so looking at a space, how it's used by a community, how people are safe within the space, um, and in regards to jargon, I'm very well educated and um, have worked on um, this type of information in municipal government for a long time. I um, had asked for um, participation in this group when there were supposed to be two selectmen and then we um, gave a seat to, I think, a school committee member and, and it went to Damon. Um, and so I've put in a lot of time and a lot of effort, um, both in the role as selectmen, but also um, in, in studying these buildings and all the intricacy. Uh, it really, to me, it's a large space and the goal is to have a, a big community space. And I think I bring a lot of value to 
um, looking at it from the lens that I've, I've, I've provided so far. Okay. Well, that's the pitch from two people who are interested in it. And from the other two people who aren't interested in it, as a chair, I'm not going to, I'm not going to make a motion. So, uh, I, I move to nominate, I move not to nominate, I move to appoint Todd as the TCP Building Design Committee representative. Do I have a second? No second. So do we have another nomination if there was no second? Okay, to the whole crew. You know how this works, right? I, I just want to make sure that you know how this works. I move to nominate Katie Adams for the TCP BDC. Does anybody nominate? Or it's very odd to nominate yourself, but go ahead. You nominated yourself. Anybody second that? Let's come back to that. All right. I have to put them both on there. We can't put them both on because there's only so many seats by the formation of the committee. Way, we changed the way it was written. By the way, welcome to the Board of Selectmen, everybody. This is where you make <laughs> tough decisions. <So. laughs> All right. Finance is an easy one because I don't know if anybody else wanted to be on the Finance Committee Appointing Committee except me. There's not a lot of stuff going on anyway. No. Any objections to that? All right. That was easy. MRPC. Jim, you said you were interested in MRPC? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. The meetings are so, so I, mean, With, I, think, <laughs> I think it was a no-brainer. I, 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 I don't see anybody strong-arming you. I don't want you to reluctantly take it. I, I want you to want to take it. Oh, no. I'll be happy to... Okay, any objections to Jim being on? Do I have to get along with the DOT here? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Didn't you read my statement on the a few agenda items ago? Communication is key in everything. Yes. So, any objections to Jim being on? And anybody else want to do it? No. All right. Sold. Congratulations. Nobody wanted to be on the MJTC, the Massachusetts Joint Transportation Committee, but we didn't have anybody, so it's no harm, no foul there. Actually, I, uh, Tom, I, I uh, would like to serve on that. Okay. Anybody else want to serve on that? Anybody object to Todd being on that? Nope. Okay. So Todd is that. MPO. I offered. To okay. Him. Anybody object to Michael being on the MPO? Massachusetts Metropolitan Planning Organization. It's really MMPO, but just generally known as MPO. I don't hear any objection. So, Michael Ray has that. Uh, the MART Advisory Board. Uh, we'll leave that, I didn't think anybody said they wanted that, right? We'll leave that open, but we should fill it. Let's come back to that at another when, when do they meet, Tom? Um, Tuesdays at 10.30 a.m. And then the Stormwater Task Force, which, again, Mr. Dwyer volunteered for. Anybody object to Mr. Dwyer being on that one? Okay. Um, seeing that uh, I'm going to be on the MJTC and the Stormwater Task Force, uh, I'm going to withdraw my uh, consideration from the TCP Building Design Committee. Um, okay. Three committees. At least, Katie, at least Katie is the TCP Building Design Committee. Anybody I, on the board object to that? I do. And it's nothing I, I, I do. I, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Objection to volunteerism. <laughs> no, I, you know, Katie, I mean, you know, when we agree, we agree. And when we don't, we don't. But I think we try to keep it civil. And uh, I mean, I think that you're not, from everything that I've 
all the previous discussions I've had with you in other committees, settings, it doesn't seem to me that you support the general vision of the TCP design committee that you said several times. That's that up to want, the town. That's not up to me. I understand that. But you but you said several times that you believe the space should be for a future. So we all have to agree to work on something. I don't think that's the right way to accomplish anything. And in my in my experience so far working with you, I found that when you are not in agreement, uh, that it's hard to get you to accept 95% of what you do agree with. That when you disagree with a part, you disagree with the whole. I feel like you're on a little bit of a personal attack here that's a bit in a well, I, I'm explaining why I, I think it would be personal sabotage if we, if we appoint you to be on the committee. And I don't, and I, and again, I just, I, I think it's harmful to have someone there who doesn't agree with the general intent or who have vocalized, have, have already vocalized conclusions in a process that's supposed to be designed to develop those conclusions. So with that, I, I will offer to join the committee. Um, it will certainly, you know, I'll offer to join the committee. I'll second that. At what, Michael joining the committee? Yes. Okay. This is a roll call vote. Mrs. Adams. No. Mr. Marino. Aye. Mr. Jeffries. Aye. Mr. Dwyer. Aye. And no from me. <clears throat> so Michael Ray is on that. Okay. Unbelievable. I will refrain from comment on that, on that, the way that went, by the way. Well, I feel like there was a lot of personal attack there that was extremely inappropriate, which was supported by the vote to exclude me. I've never personally attacked the way any other member responds or thinks or acts. I find a lot of that to have been very personal and extremely inappropriate. I've never heard another board member talk about how t Tom talks or Tom responds or Tom thinks. I just find it absolutely inappropriate. And the fact that it was seconded and then voted to pass um, is, I just, I don't think it's appropriate. I can accept your response to that, Katie. Certainly, I am not here to offend you. Uh, oh, it was offensive. <laughs> I, and I, again, I understand that. It was certainly not my intent to offend you. I wanted to offer you the reason why I strongly do not support you being on the TCP Design Committee. Well, did we hear how you feel about it? No. Did anybody ask in further discussion? No. So how do we know? This isn't about how we feel about it. It's about offering participation. There's seven members on the group. I, in, in the town voted to come up with with providing what a cost would be for the project. That's where we're at. The town has not voted for the project. We are a far cry from having that as a project. And having a diversity of thought, um, I certainly think is appropriate. To eliminate diversity of thought is, is a shocking approach to government. It is, but your appointment would also put two members of the same household on the same committee. I mean, I, and that's something, that, uh, or maybe not of the same household. Excuse but two me? People. In a, in a relationship. <laughs> Mr. Jeffrey, Mr. Jeffries, by the way, Mr. Jeffries, you're way out of line. Way out of line. Okay. And I can accept that, but I'm explaining no, why. No, this needs to stop that. now. So. Unacceptable, Mr. Chair. So, you know, first of all, the way, the way that happened, uh, while I don't agree that it was a personal attack, the fact that somebody didn't even put their name in and puts their name in just to block somebody is not the way this is all supposed to work. Okay, I'd be the first to say that. But your comments there were, were really way out of line, Mr. Jeffries, and I would caution you on making kind of accusations about things like that that are really out of the bounds of, of appointments and things of, of that nature. So um, we're going to move on, but again... Before we move on... 
Well, what? Do, well, what do you mean? What, what do you want? We don't. We have to move on. We can't go back. The board did take a legal vote. I mean, I can voice my displeasure with how the vote happened. I suppose, and on an agenda item, we should talk about etiquette because this has gotten extremely inappropriate just to block me for volunteering to participate in something I think I could have been of value to, then to take it to a personal level is completely unacceptable. And we need to talk about this further in some capacity. I'm happy to talk to you. No, Mr. Jeffries, please. You don't need to bully each other at selectmen's meetings. On Zoom or otherwise. I have not used the mute for any reason in this in the time we've been doing this. Please do not make me start this now. Let's just stop the conversation and let's move on to the next agenda item. Approval of minutes, April twenty eighth, twenty twenty. Did everybody read through them? And to a motion regarding the minutes. So moved. Second. Yeah, make the motion. I'll accept the motion. I didn't say anything. I move to approve the minutes of April 20th. Do I have a second? Second. Well, two, members, two members weren't here, so I'll second it. All those in favor, well, uh, Ms. Adams. Mr. Well, Mr. Marino can't vote on them. He wasn't present. Mr. Jeffries. Aye. I, for me, Mr. Dwyer, can't vote on them. I will give Ms. Adams a moment here. We'll come back to that vote. Warrants. Do we have any warrants? Once, uh, Mr. Chairman, that you signed. I, I, I was, yeah. Do we have the amounts? Order. I did not get an email regarding the amounts that I can announce. I can, um, I found the email so I can um, read it aloud. It was warrant number 6720 uh, dated June 29th, 2020 for $259,102.15 and warrant number one for fiscal 21 dated 7-1-2020 for $1,507,561.60, which that included the retirement assessment. Okay. And those were signed on Monday when I got back from vacation. Correct. Regarding the approval of minutes, Ms. Adams, do you approve the April 28th minutes? Oh, sorry. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Any action items? Yes. Go ahead, Mr. Jeffries. So I have a couple items for uh, follow up for Heather. So Two weeks ago, I had asked for uh, reports provided from staff to um, boards and commissions. Um, I think I asked for that support DPW. Uh, written reports are not done. They're when uh, the DPW attends meetings, he provides verbal reports. Okay, I would. I would urge that there's probably a need for there to be some written correspondence that's looking at upcoming events to to help improve the communication. Um, I also asked for a facility asset management report. Um, that was the report that identifies the lifespan of building critical building systems and uh, what their replacement schedule is. So I spoke with the facilities director about that. There's a new uh, document like that. He does do daily logs of his activities around every town building. Um, as a matter of practice, all the regular maintenance scheduling is known to him the different times of the year that needs to be done. 
um, as well as contracts with different vendors to come in different times of the year. So um, I would urge as well that a critical part of facility management is keeping track of your building systems. Um, and, and again, um, as someone who does this um, for a living, I, it's a little shocking to hear that, but I would, you know, what I think the reasonable industry norm here is that we keep track of in every building that there's uh, a record of, for example, the heating system, what type of heating system it is, all you know, critical components of that heating system, when that heating system was installed, what the average lifespan is of that heating system, um, and what the replacement plan is for that heating system. And that that's an example. You also have roof systems. You know, there's a whole bunch of different systems and buildings. But that's what the facility asset management plan is. And that way we don't find ourselves in a position where our roof is leaking and now we have other damage that happens as a result of it. Or a boiler wasn't replaced on time and now we're in a critical emergency situation in the middle of winter time. And now we have a very costly repair, et cetera. So these are common critical tools that I would also urge uh, the creation of and certainly will assist in that. Uh, you mentioned that there's maintenance logs, but what's common is a quarterly maintenance report. You know, sprinkler inspections have to happen every quarter. There's annual inspections for boilers, annual inspections for um, overall for your sprinkler systems. Every five years, there's hydrostatic tests that have to be done in elevators, et cetera. All this stuff is captured on quarterly maintenance logs. Do we have those quarterly maintenance logs? No, those don't exist in writing either. Just by, like I said, by the facilities director knowing the job and knowing the things that need to be done on a regular basis. I would also urge that and since we're talking about uh, tens or hundreds, over $100 million worth of buildings and equipment, that we do have and develop very quickly a plan uh, for that as well. Uh, the other item, and I'm, I mentioned this in email, I'll just saw so mentioning it here, is that I, I did ask for a line item budget um, that based on what was approved for all departments uh, within town government, not including the schools. And that was, you know, I know that one was prevented, presented to us in draft form back in February, um, but just to see the, the where we're at with how we're allocating funds for the year based on the approved budget. And I, you mentioned already that you can get that to me in the next week or so, so I appreciate that. Committee reports, are there any? A holiday, I'm assuming not. No old business, so we'll go to town manager report and the COVID-19 update. <clears throat> Great, announcement of existing vacancies. There are two alternate vacancies on the Agricultural Commission, one vacancy in the Americans with Disabilities Act Commission, two vacancies on the Architectural Preservation District Commission, one vacancy on the Board of Health, vacancies for fence viewers. There are two vacancies uh, for the Finance Committee, one vacancy on the Historical Commission, one vacancy on the Open Space Committee, one vacancy on the Personnel Committee, one vacancy on the Senior Center Property Tax Work-Off Committee, and two associate vacancies on the Zoning Board of Appeals. Interested people that would like to put an application for any of those vacancies can find the application forms on the town website, and they can be sent to the Board of Selectmen's office. An update on the fuel tanks, the Conservation Commission, Approve the notice of intent for the installation of new above ground fuel tanks located at the DPW at their meeting on July 1st. The project engineer will now move forward and putting together a bid package for the project to go out to bid. And I will update the board when the advertisement date is known. The Saliba property acquisition and the submittal of park and land grant documents. In the last few weeks, I've worked with town council Open Space Chairman Brandon Kibbe, the Conservation Administrator Matt Marrow, the Finance Director Karen Brochu, the DPW as they did the installation of the parking lot, and the Chairman of the Board to ensure we had everything lined up for the closing of the Saliba property. Um, the closing was on 
June 24th, and uh, we need to submit reimbursement by June 30th. This subsequent to the closing, there was a sufficient, uh, significant amount of coordination to put together the reimbursement submission for the $400,000 land grant and the $100,000 park grant by June 30th. I submitted all the required documents on June 26th and received confirmation of receipt by the grants program supervisors at the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs shortly thereafter. I want to thank all parties involved that were uh, part of finalizing all the, the acquisition uh, component and the submission for the grant requests. 17 and 23 West Street disposal, Mead, Tellerman and Costa handled the closing for the property at 17 and 23 West Street on June 24th, and the town received the funds on June 26th. This additional revenue will positively impact our certified free cash this coming fall. Updates from the town's workers' compensation, liability, property, and health insurance company. The town's insurance company, Massachusetts Interlocal Insurance Association, otherwise called MIA, has provided the town with financial relief during fiscal 21 in two significant ways. Our fiscal 21 payment for workers' compensation, liability, and property insurance is normally due at the beginning of July in order to receive a 3% discount, and they have extended this deadline until September 15th. This will provide more flexibility to towns um, relative to cash flow. Another significant decision by the Maya Health Trust Board of Directors was to approve a relief package designed to assist its members by releasing a total of 25 million of reserves back to the membership in the form of a premium holiday for the July health insurance premiums. This means that the July 2020 medical premiums for all HMO and PPO plans will be reduced by 50%. This affects both employees and the town positively as employees only had to pay 50% of their health insurance premium for their July payment. And the town and school will have to pay 50% less for the premiums that are due in July. This equates to approximately a $50,000 savings on the town side and approximately 118,000 on the school side. We will reserve this money as surplus funds that can be reduced or reallocated at the special town meeting in the fall. We also received participation and dividend credits from Maya totaling $16,778 that will go towards reducing our fiscal 21 insurance premium payment. <laughs> Fiscal 21 budget updates. The legislature passed a compromise chapter 90 bill for municipal road and bridges totaling 200 million. Lunenburg's apportionment for the fiscal 21 year is $415,929. This past fiscal year, our apportionment began at $414,649 and then was increased to 456,000 $114 due to a supplemental budget that was passed uh, later in this past fiscal year. And um, so right now we're at the fiscal, essentially the fiscal 20 levels without a supplemental budget. On June 26, Governor Baker signed a $5.25 billion interim budget for fiscal year 2021 that will allow the state to pay its bills beginning July 1st in the absence of a final appropriations bill. The interim state budget will fund local aid payments based on the fiscal 2020 cherry sheet estimates for the month of July, unless a final state budget is approved. On today's weekly call with the Lieutenant Governor, it was relayed they will be focusing heavily over the next couple of weeks on the fiscal 21 budget process, and we'll have more information on incoming revenues by the end of the month as well as having our U.S. Senators and Representatives actively trying to create more flexibility with federal relief packages to cities and towns. An update on 925 Mass Ave. The firm that is conducting the Phase 2 site assessment of 925 Mass Ave submitted the Quality Assurance Project Plan in April as required by the EPA. 
This is a written document that outlines the procedures uh, monitoring project will use to ensure that the data it collects and analyzes meets project requirements. The EPA responded today that they will be approving the quality assurance project plan and I will have further updates after the Monachusett Brownfields group meeting that is scheduled for July 16th. The police chief position due to Chief Marino's retirement on July 31st. The police chief position has been posted and we will be accepting applications until July 23rd. When conducted, the interviews will be conducted by a panel that will consist of a current police chief from another community, a retired police chief, the fire chief, the HR director, and myself. I fully expect that a decision will be after Chief Marino's retirement and therefore I expect to be presenting an appointment for an interim um, police chief until the position is permanently filled at an upcoming Board of Selectmen's meeting. Other meetings, events, and announcements. The Finance Committee has a meeting via Zoom Thursday, July 9th at 7 p.m. The Planning Board has a meeting via Zoom Monday, July 13th at 6.30 p.m. Any questions? Yes. Mr. Jeffries. In order to, um, you know, uh, hiring a police chief is a really big deal. And uh, certainly congratulations to Chief Marino on his upcoming retirement. Um, I would just ask if we can, as part of the ratification process for us, you know, I think it's important that we give some distance to this process. Um, but I think it's more important that we also get the uh, questions, the a copy of the resumes and a copy of just kind of a summary or just what the questions that were asked in the interviews were and the answers uh, prior to or along with your uh, recommendation. Is that something that's objectionable? Um, it is the town. It is the town manager's appointment. Mm -hmm. So therefore, the process is really up to the town manager. But to be clear, do we have we have to ratify that appointment, right? Yes, but you don't get to choose from everybody they interview. You get to choose. You get to ratify up or down whoever the town manager chooses. Yes, and so okay. my request then was for the resume and the and the question that were asked during the interview and the answers for that to be provided to us along with her recommendation of that individual. Correct. Up the, okay. Well, that's it's still up to the town manager. That's I, I, I misunderstood. I thought you wanted all the applicants. I'll take that down. I just want to like think it through. Think about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions on the town manager report? Okay. Okay. Um, updates related to COVID-19. As of July 3rd, there are 70 confirmed positive cases in Lunenburg and one death. The, um, as I discussed earlier in the meeting, the Parks Commission voted on July 2nd to open the town beach to the public. That will begin on Monday, July 13th, with a closing date of Sunday, September 13th. And upon hiring of the staff, the recreation director will work with the staff to get them trained and ready for the planned opening on July 13th. Town facilities, town, town and school playgrounds and school fields. Town facilities are currently open to the public by appointment only and residents can contact the department they wish to set up an appointment with by contacting them through the contact information on the town website. The town and school playgrounds are, are open. The town and school basketball courts are open. The school tennis courts are open. The middle school, high school track and turf field is open and all town fields were never closed. Organized groups that wish to use town fields need to go through the recreation director, Kayla Wright at K W R I G H T at LunenbergOnline.com for a scheduling field time. Council on Aging Updates, the Meals on Wheels volunteer drivers are back as of July 6th and are still delivering twice a week. 
counseling aging director and staff are assisting with bringing the meals out to drivers from the Eagle House. The drive through events have been going very well. And on starting on July 20th, there will be a limited number of indoor programs of no more than 10 people at the Eagle House. Program attendees will have temperatures taken, social distancing protocols will remain in place, and the director has acquired new vinyl chairs that have uh, been treated with an antibacterial. The attendees will be asked to leave directly after events and all chairs will be sanitized after use. On July 20th at 1.30 p.m., there will be a monthly grief support group meeting. On July 21st at 1 p.m., there will be a Stronger Seniors chair exercise video. And on July 22nd at 1 p.m., there will be an indoor movie. The library curbside pickup for books began on June 15th and is going well. Staff is back in the building and any return books are quarantined for at least three days. Beginning on June 2nd, all borrowed items that had been checked out and picked up through the curbside pickup process reflect their actual due dates. All digital material, materials are still available and the library Wi-Fi can be accessed through the parking lot at the library. The summer reading program began on June 28th and that goes until July 25th and that can be found at Lunenburg library.org. All staff can still be reached by phone or email between 9 and 5, Monday to Thursday, and 9 to 2 on Saturdays. State updates. As of July 6, there are 104,659 cases and 7,983 deaths. And as um, of July 6, 893,000 939 patients have been tested to date. Other state news is that on uh, yesterday, as of yesterday, phase three began out of the four-phased approach. And there were also updates related to gatherings that will go and went into effect on July 6th. So the following businesses are eligible to reopen in step one of phase three. And um, also on this call that I was on today, they talked about phase three. Phase three is going to be a longer phase than the other phases. Um, and it's all going to be data driven. So there's going to be, sounds like three different steps of phase three. So the following business, businesses are eligible to reopen. Movie theaters and outdoor performance venues, museums, cultural and historical sites, fitness centers and health clubs, certain indoor recreational activities with low potential for contact, professional sports teams under the authority of league-wide rules, um, and those may be held without spectators. So each of those categories has a subject to mandatory safety standards that can be found on the state website with their guidance on how they um, can open properly. And uh, a lot of their, there's restrictions within each of those groups. Like for instance, um, movie theaters, it's like 25 people um, allowed in a, a theater. I think it was 40% occupancy total. The revised gatherings order, under the updated gatherings order, indoor gatherings are limited to eight people per thousand square feet, but should not exceed 25 people in a single enclosed indoor space. Outdoor gatherings in enclosed spaces are limited to 25% of the facility's maximum permitted occupancy with a maximum of 100 people in a single enclosed outdoor space. This includes community events, civic events, sporting events, concerts, conventions, and more. This order does not apply to outdoor unenclosed gatherings if proper social distancing measures are possible. That's all I have related to COVID-19 updates. Okay. Any questions about that from anybody? Okay. Upcoming meeting event schedule. So we meet next Tuesday on Bastille Day. Chief Marino, if you can figuratively put somebody in prison so we could free them, that would be great. Uh, 
And then we'll have a meeting on the 21st will be the last meeting of the month. Any public comment from the public? Mr. Passios. Sorry, having technical problems with everything this evening. Uh, Dave Passios, 56 Whiting Street, again speaking as a citizen of Lunenburg. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to congratulate this board for questioning the uh, bus contract payout. Uh, I attended the school committee meeting that dealt with this, and there was very little discussion. It was kind of the, the feel I got was their attitude was, well, what else can – what? can we do other than pay it? And I, I applaud you for questioning and um, looking for more information. I, I think there was sufficient information this evening, but more information never hurts on a topic like this. And personally, as a citizen, I do not believe we should be paying out that money. Uh, secondly, uh, update on our town charter. I sure hope that the uh, Home rule petitions that you voted on today don't take as long as this one has. Um, but after it uh, left the Senate, uh, which only took about two or three days to go through the three readings and moved on to the House of Representatives, uh, Senate Bill S-2754 has sat in a steering committee, committee and no action has been taken since June 11th. Um, I implore anybody that has any interest in this charter getting finalized to contact our representative and ask why this isn't moving forward. There are other home rule petitions that have been moved forward very quickly. Uh, there are advantages to having ours in place as well as those others that they uh, move forward. And COVID-19, yes, was a priority, uh, but they've been able to move some of these uncontested uh, items forward very quickly. Lastly, <clears throat> excuse me, um, as I bring before you again, probably for the third or fourth time, um, the issues surrounding the cemetery uh, are deeply embedded in the DPW operations. I've implored you or asked you to make that one of your goals for the 2021 year as the Board of Selectmen to have this whole situation fully analyzed and correct the issues. Um, uh, I, I question the, the rota rotating door of employees in and out of that department. Uh, I question whether uh, proper exit interviews were done to really understand why we have a revolving door. You know, we always get the answer that, oh, we don't pay enough. Well, I know for a fact that that's not the only reason. Um, and exit interviews uh, with the correct people, especially where we have an HR department now, uh, can shed light on some of those things. So I hope and, and I want you to understand that these issues are not going to go by the wayside in the next few weeks or the next few months unless they're dealt with. Thank you. Thank you. The, the discussion of goals, Madam Town Manager, leads me to remind we should put goals on either the next meeting agenda or or the, the 21st. <clears throat> Any other public comment from the public? Any public comment from the board? There is none. Uh, I would entertain a motion of adjournment. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Ms. Adams? Aye. Mr. Jeffries? Aye. Mr.